Okay, so we're gonna get started with the biostats portion. Um, so Dr. Smith taught us uh, biostats and Dr. Ramdas taught us the epidemiology. So we had different slides than you guys, but I knew y'all wanted to uh, obviously see your slides instead of our old slides. So I just went ahead and went through your material instead of my old notes. So we'll go with that. I just wanna say that I found some of the biostats material um, difficult, but I did okay on the exam. So um, if you find some of it complicated, just know that a lot of the exam questions are um, not as bad as some of the practice stuff and all that. Yeah, all it right. was pretty, it was difficult, but it wasn't as difficult as I anticipated on the actual exam. All right, so we could get started with some basic definitions. When you talk about quantitative versus quanti qualitative, right? So we're talking about numerical versus categorical. Nominal basically means naming things such as colors. Ordinal can be subjective such as pain, right? Pain scale one to five or whatever. So you wanna just know these just in case um, they ask you those be easy points. And you could further uh, break these down into these different um, categories, interval and ratio. Uh, depending on the circumstance. So just know these definitions and you'll be good there. Um, also just being able to break it down in case they give you an example such as height or temperature, just knowing which one falls in each. And obviously um, as you go from left to right, uh, they become um, more detailed, right? Nominal being just a color and you can kind of get more information through a ratio, right? A true zero uh, value. Now, uh, Everybody knows mead, median, and mode. I don't want y'all to get confused because these can be uh, easy points on the test. So mean, of course, you're just calculating the averages, add up all the numbers and divide it by the values they give you. Median is gonna be your middle number. So the trickiest way they could do this for you guys is, well, what's the median number here or the middle number here? Just remember, if you get two numbers, um, you know, you have an even number of variables. If you get two numbers, uh, you just take the, the average of those two. They did put us, uh, put one of these just like this on our exam. Um, but what if it's like 10 and 11, right? So you would take the average 10.5. It doesn't have to be a whole, no whole number. Okay, so just make sure you uh, know that. Now, if you talk about mode, we're talking about the most common number, right? So you can actually have multiple modes. You don't, there's no averages going on. So if you're, if you're calculating mean or median, you're gonna have one number as your answer, but you could have a multimodal answer, right? So here you could see four and 15 are, are both considered modes. Um, so this would be sort of like a bimodal distribution. And this is actually common. You'll see these in you know, certain cancers or, or a lot of diseases, right? So you see this bimodal distribution, some breast cancers you'll see uh, happen mid twenties and then at, uh, at menopause, right? So you can see this bimodal distribution. So uh, just keep that in mind. They could give you something like that, right? And you can see that here. So um, the modal uh, distribution is, is this. Um, but we'll look at some of the skewing uh, just in case uh, they ask you guys about that too. Pretty uh, straightforward. You've seen all of these different types of graphs before at this point. Um, if anything, you have obviously seen histograms, but maybe you didn't know it was called a histogram. So it just kind of breaks down. It's kind of like your grades. Your grades are uh, distributed uh, as a histogram, like how many people got each score. Right. So we classically see this bell curve when we look at grading scales, but just uh, as an example, keep the histogram uh, in mind when you're thinking about like your grades. Right. Um, right. And this is our normal distribution, our Gaussian or bell curve that we're uh, used to looking at. So we'll look at that a little bit more detail. Uh, later. So, um, and then there's some calculations when we look at the whiskers and the, the box plots um, where you're trying to account for outliers, right? So sometimes when you have these outliers, it skews the data completely out of the way. So at some point you have to say, uh, you know, at what level do we say these are, these are not significant towards our data? And that's what you use those whiskers and the box plots, which we'll get to in a second. Because theoretically, you can have 100 people that you're taking a test for, and one of those people may have a one in a million disease, right? It, it, it's not likely, but it's theoretical. It could happen, and they would be an extreme outlier and skew the data. So we'll look at that in a second as well. Now, um, We'll look at these uh, range is just kind of like 
uh, what uh, from from top to bottom are, are your complete scores. I like we can use grading systems here too. Just remember when you do these, you're not taking averages, you're taking the median, right? So um, the first thing you take all the data and you find the original median, that's gonna be your Q2. Q, that's a Q. Q2. Um, and then from that, so you have half the, actually, let's try and do this. I wanna see if this works. This may be easier. Me and Keyshore tested it out a little while ago. All right, yeah. Okay, right. So take all your numbers and you get your Q2. That's gonna be your variable in the middle. So half of the numbers fall below it and half of the numbers are gonna be above it. Uh-oh, it's a little delayed, sorry guys. So from that point to find Q1, you're taking the median again, right? Median of the lower numbers and the median of the upper numbers. So that's all you really need to know for these. And then you have your three ranges. And then the inter range is gonna be inter or something like that, uh, is gonna be your Q1 to Q3, okay? And then we'll look at it in a second where you actually use the whiskers to determine at what point are the outliers too far out. So a uh, key point here is that you want to this over there. Um, that we're worried about medians here, okay? And that's how you calculate that. Now, uh, if you want to see it in words, this is kind of what we looked at here. And again, if it is an even number that you're looking at, you have to average the two middle numbers. So this is what we're talking about. What are the whiskers? These are the whiskers, these purplish lines that come across. So anything outside that data set is considered outliers. We're not necessarily going to you know, put this in our research paper. Um, you know, they may skew the data too much. So when we're determining the whiskers, it's Q1 minus 1.5 times this range here, okay? Um, I don't know if they make you calculate that, but they may give you this graph and you know, tell, uh, ask you where the outliers are or, or what points, you know, um, they could really go any way with it. All right, so uh, you're familiar with this. This is our normal range. Um, and it's kind of just taking this box plot and lying it on a, on a graph. But look, this isn't necessarily standard deviations here, right? It doesn't correlate exactly to it. Uh, but we'll get to that in just a second. Variance is kind of weird, right? So you you so uh, you take the distance from the mean and square it. That's fine. But to do the uh, the um, standard deviation, you take the square root of it. So you basically just go backwards, right? So the variance is squaring it. Uh, you square, you, you know, you square the number and then taking the standard deviation, you take the square root. So you're, you're basically back to X. So whoever made standard deviation didn't like the guy that made variance, I guess. And he decided, let's just go back to that. But what, when you do the standard deviation compared to the variance, you, you're, you're squishing your plots down, right? So you're making, you know, you're taking, you're getting smaller numbers. So it's more of a linear distribution. It's just the easier way of doing it. I remember Dr. Smith explaining that to us. I don't know, it kind of made sense if the, if the numbers are closer together. Um, right, and so you would expect in a normal distribution, this, this bell curve, right? If it's a proper bell curve, everything will equal each other. The mean should equal the median, should equal the mode. So that's how you distribute it. Fair question, they could ask you that. And then we'll look at the skews in a second. Now, these numbers are going to be very important. When we talk about one standard deviation, 68% of the grades or whatnot should fall in between that. And then if you go to two standard deviations, 95 should, and then three standard deviations, 99.7. So you definitely need to remember these numbers down here to know what falls within what. I think the trickiest thing they could do is if they say some person fell below the average below the mean, but they were still within uh, one standard deviation, okay? So how would that work out? If they fell below the mean right here, but they were still standard deviation, you don't wanna put 68% because they're below the mean, you would get this 34%, okay? Hope that makes sense because, uh, so it's important to know not only 
the standard deviation, but sometimes if they tell you which way you fall to know you, you have to half it from the original number. Okay, I think that's as difficult as they can make it on you guys. You probably came across some practice questions like that. So um, they like these numbers a lot. So make sure you know those. Uh, a little bit more of the same. So it's one standard versus two versus three. You can see that there. And this is just from first aid, kind of outlines everything for you guys. And we'll look at standard error of the mean in just a second. All right, so what are we looking at here? So, you know, we still, we can still appreciate the fact that here our mean and median and mode are all going to be the same, right? But what's different? Well, our standard, our standard deviation is different. If we look at the yellow line, our standard deviation is right there versus the blue line is kind of centralized, right? So what would you consider a more, okay, so say you were writing a test, what would you want better, right? You'd want, you know, um, you'd want it to be a closer or a, a lower standard deviation, right? Which means the students kind of fell in a, in a better range, a more, you know, the, 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 the values uh, didn't fall, you know, erratically around the mean. And, you know, that's with any research paper or whatnot. Um, you kind of want your numbers clustered toward the center because that kind of gives you more validity to it. And what you'll find is, and this is kind of a good point to be made, that's kind of where standard error of the mean comes in. Um, the, the, the increased number of data points you have, subjects, test scores, whatever, the more, the closer you're gonna to get to the mean, all right? The closer you're gonna to get to this blue line. And that's just because uh, statistically, uh, the more values you have, the more you're going to fall around the average. Now, you may have a few outliers, but when you look at the entire uh, dynamic situation, um, you're going to fall uh, more towards the middle. So it makes the more uh, values you have, the, um, the more valid the test, right? That makes sense. The more subjects you have in a research or in some sort of trial, um, the more, the, the more um, valid it will be. Okay, so yeah, and this is kind of what I was just explaining here. So smaller becomes narrower, narrower, and then um, if it's large, if larger standard deviation, it becomes wider. So they very well could ask you that on the test, um, uh, giving you the different graphs. Now this is fairly straightforward when we look at precision versus accuracy. So precision, yeah, um, I have a better uh, illustration of this, yeah, coming up. Um, so precision is like clustering, okay? Like if you were shooting at a target, these clustering, um, the, pull up the pin, come on. Or not. You can see here that there's clustering, right? They're, they're precise. When you shoot the gun, you, they, all, they all come out in a cluster, right? So this shows high precision means um, everything, all the, all the shots fall in a certain range. Now, accuracy, you're trying to, this is where you're shooting for, all right? So you have precision, you can pinpoint it, but you're not shooting at the, nest, at the target. So if you, if you look at this graph here, you can see that it is accurate. You know, the, if you average all these out, they kind of fall towards the middle, but they're not exactly precise because they're not in a clustered set. Ideally, you want everything accurate towards the bullseye and clustered, which will give you increased precision. I do have another picture coming up later on when we talk about it, but yeah. So um, I remember we did have a question like this. They gave us these little bullseyes, asked which one is precise and accurate or whatever. So easy points there. All right, so when we look at skewed distribution, you always define it by which way the tail is going. So negative skew, right, if you want to graph, is going to be pointing to the left a positive skew is gonna to be to the right, right? And then we'll look at coming up. Okay, this is super important. Whenever you have skew, so which way is this skew? Positive skew, right? The tail goes to the right, positive direction. This is always gonna be the case. The, the mode is gonna be in the middle, right? The most common number. The median, the middle number will be next and the mean will be uh, the furthest. So you would always expect the mode to come first at the peak the median to come second and the mean to come third. The mean's gonna be always towards the tail, whichever the tail side is, right? So if we looked at this the other way, right? If we had a tail this way, like, oops, that's awful. Okay, like that. Actually, let me do this. 
if um, if we had a ta a tail like this, it's not even a very good. Let's see. We'll call that a tail. All right. So always find the mode first. That's your top point. Median comes in, so we have a negative skew, right? Negative. Median's going to come next. And uh, uh, and then the, the mean will be third. All right. Very straightforward. I just wanted to point this out for you because I would venture to guess that you will have a question like that. All right, cool. And you can see this here. Again, we've talked about this bimodal distribution and then whichever way you're looking at it, find the mode first, that's your top peak and everything else falls towards the tail, median next and then mean. All right, okay, super easy way. I, when I was looking at this in first aid, um, a light bulb went out, super easy way to define what test you're looking at. We don't talk about this one to my knowledge, this Fisher's test, but let's talk about T-test and Novin chi-squared. T-test and ANOVA test are always gonna be looking for averages, okay? So if you're looking for an average and you have two variables, it's a T-test, T for two. Uh, and if it's three or more variables, you're gonna use ANOVA. So all you need to do is look, to, and if they're asking for a mean or the average, uh, it's one of these two. Now, if you're talking about categories, but they're not necessarily looking for averages, no averages involved, they just want categorical, then you use the chi-squared test. So that's the easy way to do it. Ask yourself, are they looking for mean? Yes, how many variables? Two or more. Two, t-test, more than that, ANOVA. If it's categorical, then you just use the chi-squared. Okay, not average is there. Piece of cake. All right, same thing here. t-test, ANOVA, gonna do means, chi-squared, um, categories, no averages involved. All right, and then regression analysis is kind of a way to make some sort of linear distribution. If you could bring everything down, your variables into uh, a certain plot, then you could kind of define it uh, for research and whatnot. Okay, and you could see some of these plots are uh, different, different patterns here, um, but they all are considered regression, right? Because you can appreciate some sort of distribution, some sort of uh, predictable distribution between them, okay? Uh, and then a linear correlation. What we'll talk about is the Pearson, Pearson, yes, Spearman's and Pearson's. Yeah, the Pearson's correlation. So if there's linear, remember we, when we talk about some sort of linear distribution, it's uh, y equals mx plus b. Y'all remember that where m is the, the, um, the slope of the line. So these linear correlations, if we were to make uh, here, you would say, I would consider this a Pearson's, right? Because you can get a linear distribution here. Um, so, and we'll get to that and here it is, right? So the key thing, it should be fairly straightforward on the exam. If you're looking for some sort of linear relationship between variables, then you use Pearson's. The way I think about it is Spearman's is kind of like, um, uh, it, it's more, you're taking more, well, it's nonlinear, right? So you're taking uh, more, I don't want to say erratic, but like, uh, mm, um, uh, wider variables, right? You're taking two different sets and overlaying them to see if you could see some sort of similarities between them, okay? So the key thing is that with Pearson's, it's gonna be a linear relationship. Uh, increased BMI with increased chance of heart failure, right? People that tend to be obese tend to have increased atherosclerosis and whatnot. So you see with increased BMI, increase uh, risk of risk of heart failure, or stroke or whatnot, or diabetes, something like that, linear relationship. So they use R as the variable. So anything, when R is close to one, you consider it a strong relationship. Uh, when it goes um, to zero, there's uh, no relationship and less than one, it's an inverse relationship, okay? So um, like we were saying with BMI and diabetes or whatnot, you would expect it close to one. Okay, zero is no relationship. And if it's negative, as in one value, as it gets lower, the other value goes higher, um, there's an inverse relationship, right? They're inversely proportional. And so, yeah, so look, this is perfect because look, these are completely inversely proportional. We're looking at a negative one here, right? 
versus they don't give us a positive one. A positive one would obviously be, it would make an X, it would go the exact opposite way. But the closer it is to one or negative one, the straighter the line is gonna be. You could see here, you can't really draw a straight line through this because um, there's no relationship. Okay, so fair game, they could ask you that, which one will give you some, uh, some values and say which one's the best for Pearson's cor or, um, correlation or uh, which one's the, the most proportional, positively or negatively. So that's our R value. And again, this is from first aid. So it's definitely fair game if it's in first aid. Um, that's always the first place I, I look to see if this stuff's important or not. Um, so you could see these correlations here. All right, now Spearman's, we're not looking at a monotone or uh, a linear distribution. Uh, we're looking at nonlinear things. So you could take two variables that mm, if you plot them, they, they don't necessarily fall in the same line or category, but you're just looking for some, some sort of relationship between them, okay? So um, by doing that, the key thing is, I believe in the STEM, they would put some sort of nonlinear relationship. Okay, so it still can be considered a, a monotone relationship as in, um, as it, so like Pearson's would be a linear relationship, right? So that would be a Pearson's, right? And then if you had Spearman's, it may be, it, the relationship may look like this, right? There's still a relationship. You can draw a concurrent line through it, but you're not, it's not necessary. it's not linear, obviously. So, you know, you'd have to see. Um, so just look at the values. Hopefully they'll give you a nice little graph or something and you could do it. But if you're um, in doubt, you know, look for the linear versus nonlinear relationship to determine those. Okay. And then they use this row. I wanted to sign. chime in for. Yeah. I'm not hearing you. Hello? Yeah. Um, I, I, I don't know if it's- Your audio is really choppy. Maybe send it in the chat and then we yeah. got, I'll look at it in the break. Okay, now standard error of the mean as was mentioned briefly earlier is like standard deviation but you're taking into account the number uh the number of variables the number of subjects uh um that you're um that you're using so um it's more of a um it's a better uh example or a better testing solution because you're taking in more factors to it the variables uh or or, or the number of subjects um so you can see that here, right? And the key thing to rem remember here, like I mentioned earlier, is the more samples you have, the lower the standard error the mean is, okay? So by increasing the denominator, if you have increase number, then your standard error the mean Right. So this is a better test, right? You have less variation here. This is a better test. The more numbers, so if you do some sort of clinical trial, the, the more number of people you have, the more variables, the closer you're going to, you closer you're going to cluster around the mean. So it's considered a better test, which makes sense in, in practical terms, right? You don't want to do some sort of a clinical trial with like five people. You could rather have 5,000 people, right? You get a better uh, um, analysis. Okay. And again, this is kind of, um, right. This is kind of explaining what I was just talking about. Hey Brady, I have a quick question. Yeah, sure. You know when we use N versus N minus one? I'm sorry, what? Where? When do we use N versus N minus one? for calculating SEM. Yeah. Yeah, this is just the, this is the only, um, this is the only equation that I think you need to know. I'm not familiar with using N minus one. Yeah. Um, I think, uh, I mean, somebody can chime in, but I think this is the whole point so of, of the, yeah, go ahead. Typically for um, whenever you're using the difference between N versus N minus one is the big N is for populations. N minus one is gonna be just for a sample. 
Okay, thank you. Um, uh, for the test, you won't, I, I don't think for these equations, we'll get to the equations you need to know, but for these equations, it'll be all theoretical. So the point I wanted to make here is that the number in your sample is gonna be super important because the higher the denominator is, uh, the lower the actual standard error the mean is going to be. Okay, so this will be one of those questions. Remember, I had mentioned um, when we talked about the advice session that a lot of these questions, sort of like the IMCQs, are all theoretical. Once we get to the uh, epidemiology, those are the equations you really need to know. But for the stats, you know, um, this is uh, the thing to focus on. But thank you. All right. Um, Right, so when we talk about uh, confidence, right, this is our confidence interval. We accept science or whoever decided, they had a big meeting uh, and they decided that 95% is gonna be our confidence interval. So we accept an alpha, an alpha, which is our error rate of 5%, okay? So if we have a 95% confidence interval on any research paper or any study we do, we ex or anything 95% or better, uh, we consider it valid, right? So that's when we talk about our null hypothesis and whatnot. So uh, significance level um, is going to be our, our alpha, right? So we, we're looking for an alpha error. As long as our p-value, okay, I don't want to get ahead of myself. So this is what we accept. So this is the same thing as saying we accept the 5% error, which is the same thing as saying we have a confidence interval of 95%. Right, we're 95% confidence that the values we take will fall into this range. All right. So, um, if we accept an error rate of 5%, uh, anything less than that, we ex we I'm sorry, we accept the hypothesis, which means we reject the null. It's very, it's very counterintuitive, or it seems very silly, but it's like saying uh, I agree with you is the same thing as saying I do not disagree with you. Right, so if we accept the alternative hypothesis or the hypothesis that we're looking at, we're also rejecting the null. So we're saying, I agree with you, or I do not disagree with you, but they like that do not disagree thing. Mathematicians, right? Okay, so yeah, and this is our 95% confidence. We'll talk about the two-tailed test in a second, but you can see that uh, if we look at the 95%, that would fall in here and then um, our alpha error would be distributed evenly between both tails, but I have that coming up in a second. So if we say our confidence level is gonna be, so we accept it as 95%, right? So 95 would, equal, oh, it's down here, sorry. Yeah, this right here, right? So 95%, that's where we stand. And let's see, right. And well, as, it, as it correlates, 95 is right around um, the two standard deviations. Okay, so remember 68% will be one, uh, 95 will be two. So anything that falls within the two standard deviations uh, will be considered valid. It's a little bit different. Uh, they just accept 95. I think there's a, a point value, 95.7 or something, but it's close enough. So your Z-score, which is some voodoo the school does to figure out our grades, all that Z-score is, is it figures out exactly how far you are away from the mean. Now, if you're asking about how the school does it, I think they use some sort of modified Z-score to scale everybody up. They don't actually until turn five, I heard they actually, they, in turn five, they do scale some of the scores down um, to make a true bell curve. But um, technically, as I've seen so far, it's always a modified, so it scales up. Um, but yeah, so it just, all your Z-square is, is gonna give you an exact value of how far you are away from the mean. Not just one standard deviation, but it'll tell you like your 1.56. And then you can multiply that by the difference uh, from where you are to the mean and they can, figure out what kind of curve to give. Um, I don't know if they'll even ask you a question about this, but it was in your notes. Uh, so I figured I would add it. All right, now, again, I'm hammering home this point because it's very important. The increase in, say, uh, the increase in number that you have um, is going to decrease the error, the standard error of the mean, right? Because our n is in the denominator, right? So if that's the case with the n in the denominator, um, the increase in number will give you a decrease standard error of the mean. 
Okay, a standard deviation. Right. Okay, that's the whole point. Okay, just in case uh, some of these values, I don't think they'll ask you to calculate, but if it's some sort of ancillary uh, data in the actual STEM, 1.96 of your Z correlates to 95%, but technically you're supposed to have a table to figure these out, but these are common uh, numbers, especially the 1.96. So if you do see that, just know that correlates to two uh, standard deviations. All right. Um, Right, again, okay, so now we're gonna talk about the errors, right? Um, yeah, so a type one error is the same thing as having an alpha error. And actually I have more for that coming up in a second. So let's look at this. So if we say, um, if we say this is our alpha error, this dotted line right here, that's our alpha. We accept anything greater than 95. If this P value, we need P to be less than 0 0.05, right? And if P is this blue shaded region, you could see it falls less than this, right? So maybe like 0 0.04 or whatnot. So we can say that this is statistically significant. We accept the alternative hypothesis or the hypothesis we're talking about, but we can also reject the null hypothesis. We agree with it. We also do not disagree with it. Yeah, so. Um, and you can see this, these are just some definitions from first aid. Okay, so the p-value is gonna be your generated uh, for your statistical test to tell you what your, basically what your confidence is in it, right? So the p-value is not, and this is very confusing, it's not, saying that the null hypothesis is necessarily true it's saying that you can't you can't reject it okay you can't say it's not true okay so you're not saying the test is necessarily invalid you're saying that there's no valid way of saying that the test is better than than chance okay i hope that made sense because if you're saying within 95 percent confidence that your hypothesis is different than than chance, right? That by doing this specific thing, um, uh, it's gonna it's gonna lead to a certain result. If it if you don't have a, a ninety five percent confidence or a p value that's less than 0 0.05, you're not you're saying that this hypothesis is not necessarily true. It may be true in some certain some circumstances, but not all the time. Okay, not confidently. Okay, so those values that fall into that range of 5% are considered chance, right? So um, if you were, to, uh, it's hard to think of an example. Um, if you were to say a certain situation happens under these circumstances, right? You, you wanna say in 95% confidence, uh, this situation happens under these circumstances, um, but you can't, your p-value is greater than 0.05, then you can't say necessarily that that's the case. You're saying that it also happens by chance. It's not necessarily the circumstances you were looking at. Okay, I hope that made sense. Uh, unfortunately, some of the simplest explanations are still very complicated because you're trying to put um, you're trying to put these number calculations into words, and unfortunately, that's how your test is going to be, though. So uh, I hope that made sense. So you're looking at differences here. So the probability and the p-value uh, is um, equal. Uh, p value are, are more extreme or you, your circumstances um, your circumstances are different. So whatever your alternative hypothesis is, you're saying that there is a difference from just chance. okay This circumstance you're looking at will happen under these conditions. And um, and this is this is against this this uh, circumstance, obtaining the study results by chance if the null hypothesis is true. Okay, so I, if you, if, what's up? Um, can I point something out? Yeah, sure. The value in the first problem set that they gave us, number five, um, that question shows a really great example of how Dr. Ramdas might test us on it because I asked him questions before. And so just when they're asking, what is, what is the meaning of the p-value in the study is different from, um, based on this p-value, what can you interpret from this study? And so if you look at number five from the problem set, um, 
the answer is number D, if they want to know the p-value, what the meaning of the p-value is, but if you're using the p-value to interpret the study, then that's when you would use C. So I just clarifying how they might test us for p-value. Okay, awesome. Can you go Thank ahead you. and read those uh, answers real quick, just so that we're all on the same page? Yeah, okay. I don't have the problem set. So um, do you guys want me to read you the problem? Yeah, sure. Okay, so a 45 year old man comes to the physician because of a one month history of side effects associated with atrovastin. He wants to be prescribed print, um, printedipro. He shows the physician results from a study that demonstrate a lower mean number of heart attacks among patients taking petrodipro. I can't say the word, <laughs> when compared to those taking astrovestrin with the p-value of 0.01. Which of the following best describes the meaning of the p-value 0.01 in this study? The answer is, if there is no difference, the chance of getting a result this extreme is 1%. That's what the p-value means. But if the, you wanted to, um, if the question asks, what, how does the p-value um, interpret the study? The answer would be, this is a real life this is a real medical advantage of switching drugs. There is a real medical advantage of switching drugs. Okay, yeah, so so, so by saying, the, taking these two drug combinations, you could say that it is within 1%, 0.01% that there, if in that, if in that amount of, so 99% chance that those uh, two medications together will correlate in a benefit. 1% of the time, it will not. Okay, but that means that th that's a valid reason why we would we would use this combination of drugs. Okay, so anything less than 0.05, uh, maybe you would say that it's not beneficial. But then, uh, and then we can look at we'll look at it in a little while when you talk about um, looking at from a clinician standpoint versus uh, the statistical standpoint. But statistically speaking, you would want a p-value of less than uh, 0.05. Okay. And then uh, the lower the p-value, more unlikely the null hypothesis is. So like in that situation, we had a 0.01. So that's only a 1% chance uh, that it would fall outside that range, the p-value. And that's acceptable, all right? So we could reject the null hypothesis. We could say that those two medications together show uh, statistical evidence that um, it would be beneficial to use them together. Thank you. All right, so again, p-value less than alpha. Alpha is our error rate if we accept that as 0.05. If the p-value is less than that, we show statistical significance. Now, there are certain circumstances where, you know, in a clinical setting, you could say, well, look, my, uh, it's, it's, you know, only two thirds of my patients show benefit, but at least some of them do. So there is a difference between when you're looking at statistics versus the actual um, clinical situation, but I have a slide on that coming up. Okay, so this is super important. Um, just breaking it down. If you p-value is less than your acceptable error rate, uh, there is a difference. So there is a difference in using these certain medications together. It's not just, the combination is not just happening by chance. So you can accept it. And then if it's greater than or equal to, uh, you, um, you do not reject, you don't accept the null, but you can't necessarily reject it. So again, this is not necessarily saying that the null hypothesis is true. You just can't rule it out, okay? And okay, so this one tail test, obviously the whole 0.05 or 5% will fall on the one tail. But if you look at the two tail test, you have to split it. So we still, on a two tail test, we still have a 95% confidence, um, but you have to split it half and half. So 0.025. Now type one error, uh, definitely need to know this correlates to a pulse, pulse positive. So this is our alpha, significance of our alpha. So a type one error is gonna be uh, the chance of getting a false positive. When we look at type two errors, that's gonna be our false negative. It's considered a beta error. Now it's important to correlate the power of a study. So this is like saying uh, the power is one minus the false negative, right? So the lower your beta error, the stronger it is, right? Because that's the lower error rate. So one minus this. Uh, will give you a strong power statistically. So if you look at this, um, you could correlate it like this. The null hypothesis would fall here, one minus your false positive, and then your alternative uh, hypothesis will be one minus your false negative, right? Which technically would be true, right? You just, uh, 
you're getting a, a negative value, but it's incorrect because it's false. So these are all your positives. So this is your power. If you have a low false negative rate, um, that can correlate to you being able to reject the null or accept the alternative hypothesis. All right, and then you could see this here. Y'all are familiar with this. Um, if we break it down, uh, you could see these are where everything falls. And I'm sure you're aware by now that on the exam, they're going to give you these, uh, these tables, which in my opinion makes it infinitely easier. I found the hardest problem, the hardest thing, especially with the practice problems, was figuring out where everything went. Um, they'll give you like the total and then you have to divide it into the boxes. They're gonna give it to you. And I know y'all had a small group where the box was flipped or something like that. They're all right, okay? So the disease will be up top and the test will be on the left side. So they'll all, they will be correct. Um, they're not going to trick you. They did it right for us. Um, so as long as you know which box correlates to which, it should be pretty easy. You could calculate, um, you know, all your desensitivity, specificity, uh, um, negative and positive predicted value. Okay. So this is again from first aid. If you want a little explanation for it, you can see that here. And this is what I was talking about. So there is a difference statistically versus clinical significance. Statistically, you're just worried about the values. You're not worried about the symptomology or the outcome. But so you're you're uh, you're saying what what are the values here? It, can we uh, reject the null? Is it the p-value less than 0.05? Yeah, okay. If that's the case, then we're good here. But clinically, it's kind of more of a subject, subjective approach to it. What what is happening to my patients in this situation? You know, there are different variables that come in. We did have a question, so this is easy points if you could differentiate these, and they give you uh, little explanations here. So definitely make sure you look at that. All right, so. We'll do epidemiology. Uh, we did have a question on this. Uh, so being able to differentiate um, the different tests. Uh, remember screening kind of falls in the middle. So first, this primordial is gonna be population prevention. So things like taxes, cigarettes, seatbelt laws, you can help you kind of like this uh, umbrella overlying. So laws and stuff like that. Then you have a prevention approach. So that's primary. So. Uh, no smoking, seatbelt, stuff like that. Secondary is going to be your screening. And then tertiary is after you have the disease. So you're assuming the patient obviously has diabetes. So diabetic foot care would be some sort of tertiary approach. So you already have the disease. So remember secondary screening, you can do S and S. Uh, tertiary, uh, prevent. So tertiary means you have the disease already. Prevent problems, problems uh, over... Um, Overcoming problems, quaternary gets a little confusing, but it has to do with the treatment. I don't think y'all will get a question on that. It'll probably be uh, one of these three, primary, secondary, or tertiary. And so there's some good examples here for y'all. Now don't get this confused with this, don't get that confused with this, because this also has words like primary, secondary, and tertiary, but this is levels of disease prevention. So in this situation, you're looking at whether the person uh, has the disease or they don't, and what level they're at. So in primary prevention, the patient is at risk for having a problem. Uh, secondary is early or you're asymptomatic, so some sort of viral infection. Maybe you contracted COVID, but you're not symptomatic for it yet. And then tertiary, uh, you have a tab established disease. So each of these steps are going to correlate to different treatment regimens, okay? So um, make sure you can correlate these, but know that uh, even though they have a lot of the same terminology, they are different. All right, now, like I said, they'll give you the tables. So the hardest part about calculating these is going to be putting these in the right place. Then it's just plug and play, right? Uh, then you could just, yeah, whatever they're asking for, sensitivity, specificity, whatnot, you just plug in the values for it. All right, so remember, like I said, they will do it right on the exam. I remember we were worried about that too. What if they flip the tables, but they did. Um, so disease up top, test on the side, and then you could figure it out. So um, I have a slide, a different slide for that. But remember, sensitivity, what you're looking at is at all people with the disease, okay? That's how I like to think of it. So you have your true positives, they have the disease, over true positives plus false negatives. Do false negatives have the disease? Yes, they do. The test just came back uh, false. It was a false negative, but they do have the disease. So sensitivity is testing all people with the disease. 
specificity is testing all people without the disease. The people that truly don't have the disease and tested negative, but also the people that came back false positives, right? They don't have the disease, the test just came back bad, okay, incorrect. Now, when you do positive predictive value, you're looking for all the positives, true positives, true positives plus false positives. Negative predictive value, all the negatives. Okay, so don't get it flipped up in your head. Um, that's kind of how I made sure that um, I didn't mix them up. Um, some people like the spin snout thing. I don't know. The, my thought process is this. Okay, so if you want to, why do you want a highly sensitive test as your screening test? Well, uh, we could take COVID, for example. The point of a highly sensitive test for screening is that by no means do you want somebody that has COVID walking out uh, thinking they don't have it, okay? So a highly sensitive test is gonna catch all the people that have the disease, okay? Now the sacrifice of that is some people are gonna test uh, positive falsely. So you're gonna get some false positives, but the whole point is you don't want anybody walking out of the building uh, that has COVID testing negative, okay? So you want a highly sensitive test to screen. Now, it kind of does suck to a degree because let's say we're tested for cancer. Um, some people are gonna test positive for cancer that don't actually have it, okay? Mm, that's not good, but it's better than sending someone home that has cancer uh, that thinks they don't, okay? So your first test, your screening test wants to be highly sensitive. Make sure you catch all the people with the disease. Then, uh, so, in that vein, you're gonna test, some people are gonna test positive that don't have it. So then you can get to a more specific test and you could say, okay, let's just make sure uh, anybody that tested that, that was a false positive, we can rule out, okay? Um, so however you look at it in and out versus, you know, the snout thing just does it the inverse, the inverted way, highly sensitive uh, when it's negative, you rule out the disease. Okay, so it just depends how you wanna do it, if this helps you out. Um, but the way I think of it is like highly sensitive test. You, if you come in for the test and you have the disease, you're gonna test positive. Nobody's walking out the door with the disease uh, testing negative, thinking they're okay, okay? So if you just think of it like that, you're good, all right? Then after that point, you go to specificity and you could see any of those uh, false positives, you could rule those out. Okay, I hope that made sense. We're good? We're good, all right. And you could see that here. So um, when we talk about positive predictive value, so the probability that a true positive is actually uh, a true positive, okay? So this is, this is now, instead of looking at the disease pattern, like sensitivity and specificity, we're looking at how good the test is. Now, unfortunately, when you look at these equations, they're kind of just moving around variables, uh, you know, uh, from numerator to denominator and whatnot. But but you have to be able to translate this into words. So keep in mind, I'm just going to go back that sensitivity and specificity. We're looking at the disease pattern, okay? Uh, and when we look at positive and negative predictive value, we're looking at how good the actual test is, okay? So let me go back to this real quick. Specificity. Remember when we put disease up top and test on the side, sensitivity goes down this column. We're looking at, remember disease up top, actually it says it right here, disease up top. So sensitivity, we're worried about the disease, everyone with the disease. Specificity, everyone without the disease. Positive predictive value, how good the test is positively at predicting positive results. Negative predictive value, we're going across horizontal. We're looking at how good a negative test is, okay? So you just kind of have to work with these. So again, if your negative predictive value says, I walked into it and I got a test, I tested negative. What, how, how do I really know I'm negative? With what percentage do I know I'm negative, right? So, so what's the possibilities? I got a false negative, right? So you could say um, it's a 99% or like the, the antigen test used to be 88%, right? Now they do PCRs for COVID, but the antigen test was 88%. So you could say uh, the negative predictive value, I got an antigen test, uh, uh, it came back negative. So I could say with 88% confidence, I'm actually negative, which isn't great. Now they do the PCR thing, but that's the idea. So again, sensitivity, specificity, you're looking at the disease pattern in the vertical columns, positive and negative predictive value, you're looking at horizontal, you're looking at how good the test is, positive versus negative. All right, hope that made sense. Same thing here, 
uh, just a little bit um, different. I think that was from the notes. All right, and same thing here, right? I'm harping on this because this is very important clinically. And so they're gonna test on it, but they'll give you the tables. This should be easy points. All right, disease patterns, positive negative. Any questions? I don't have the chat up because I don't have my other screen. Going once, going twice, are we good? I'll take that as a yes. I All right. Question. Yeah, sure. How does the NPV relate to the sensitivity? Because in that one clip down there, it's if, if NPV, uh, I'm trying to wrap my head around that. Like if yeah. NPV goes up, it increases with a uh, highly sensitive test? So or? yeah, so this is a little confusing, but I'll show you how sensitivity correlates to negative predictive value. Why is that? Okay, so negative predictive value is true negative over true negative plus false negative. Now, um, right, uh, is that right? True negative, okay. And then- Does that have to tie into that snout thing where it's yeah, like- Yeah, so you could, yeah, that's how they out. do that. Uh, okay, and then it's the... um, spin, snout, spin, spin, has specific, no, I'm sorry, that's the other one. It's, uh, see, I don't use that, but people really like that. How do I go back? Snout, if it's sensitivity yeah. is negative, it rules it out. So. Snout, yeah, out. If it's negative, then it rules it out. Yeah, so the false negative false here. See, I was looking at this. Uh, okay, so here, I'm sorry, okay, yeah, yeah. Okay, so the whole point, the whole point of a highly sensitive test is that you don't want anybody to walk out with that, right? Let's say we have COVID. Right. The whole point is nobody's allowed to walk out of your office with a false negative result. This is how I wrap my head around it in like words versus numbers. So this is a no-no. Nobody with COVID is allowed to have a false negative test, all right? Nobody's walking out of the office uh, thinking, they're, uh, thinking they're negative, but they actually have the disease. This person who is false negative right here, they are positive. They're positive for COVID. They have the disease, all right? So the whole point is the higher the sensitivity, by increasing your sensitivity, you're decreasing your false negative rate. You're decreasing the chance that somebody's gonna walk out of your office with a negative result when they have COVID, correct? So highly sensitive test correlates to a high negative predictive value simply because we're looking at decreasing our false negative rate. Does that make sense? Yes, no? Oh, yes, thank you. Yeah, I okay. see it there yeah. uh, in the like the math. Yeah, I got it. So yeah, um, just, go ahead. an increased PPV would be a increase in specificity? Right, exactly. It's the exact opposite. So specificity uh, would, uh, high spec specific tests or highly high specificity would, in would correlate to an increased positive predictive value. Thank so in, in, in the other, yeah. And so you could use that spin snout thing for this. Um, but I like it just because in case they put it in, you know, in words on the test, the whole point of a, sense, a highly sensitive test is we want to eliminate our false negatives. All right. Nobody's allowed to walk out with the disease. And you can see in the negative predictive value, um, this in the denominator. We want to keep that as a low number. Okay. That's how I wrap my head around it. But if you want to spin snout, that's fine too. Just get it right on the test. All right, cool. Now, um, just more equations. Um, on my drive in the additional resources, there is, it's like a one page document. Uh, it's got all the equations y'all need. It's typed up, somebody did it. So it's all there. I put little snippets of it in here for you guys um, too. All right, so now let's talk about prevalence and accuracy. Um, same thing, they'll probably get that. They're going to give you the table. You have to figure this out. So, what's the difference here? Prevalence is we're saying um, 
everybody with the disease over the total amount. So how prevalent is the disease in population? So 5% of the people have it or whatever. So we're, the, the numerator has to have all our true positives plus all our false negatives. Do the false negatives have the disease? Yes, they do, right? So they, they count towards uh, the prevalence of the disease. So we take our true positive plus false negative over the total population. Okay, so this prevalence, put it in the category with sensitivity and specificity. We're worried about the disease here. Now, accuracy, this is sort of like positive and negative predictive value. We're worried about how good is the test? So here we're saying, what are our, how accurate is the test? True positives, true negatives over everybody. What percentage do we get right? Okay. All right, cool. Um, now, uh, let's see. So one of the situations you can have, so this is important. So make sure y'all look at this little table because they get asked y'all a uh, little, um, you know, uh, about these individual uh, situations. But the prevalence, the, the more chronic a disease is, the more prevalent it'll be, right? Because people will live long with the disease. So it'll be greater than the incidence. If they equal each other, equal each other the, you know, they're, they're going to be dying off because the incidence is going to equal the prevalence. But with uh, more chronic diseases, you're going to just be adding the incidence. You're going to be, each time you get a new person that has a disease, you're going to be adding it to the prevalence. So the disease is prevalent in population. Um, and um, so you're not necessarily getting uh, a lot more people. Like the incidence rate isn't going up very fast, but because these people are living longer, uh, it, the prevalence is going up. Okay, the prevalence of the disease. Now, the thing I wanted to point out here is when you have some sort of novel treatment uh, that you're doing, some sort of new chemotherapy, um, so people are living longer, that's the same situation. Okay, same thing as a chronic disease is with new treatments. Uh, the prevalence is going up, uh, so um, compared to the incidence rate, just because people are living longer. Now, this is really tricky too, uh, but um, it's important. It was in your notes. And um, so the increased prevalence of the disease is going to increase your positive predictive value. And that just means there are more people in the population that will test positive. So in sheer numbers, your positive predictive value will go up. All right, because it's just, it's just more common in the population. All right, and we did talk about this previously. Um, precision, we're looking at a clustering pattern, right? Whereas accuracy is around the bullseye. And this is what we're, we want. We want accurate around the bullseye, plus we want it precise, okay? We want this clustering pattern, okay? Uh, this is what I was talking about. This is part of the uh, document I have with these equations. Um, so got to know them. Um, if you could work out in your head kind of where everything fits in, uh, it'll help you out. But again, they're gonna give you those tables. So it's gonna make it, it, it really does make it a lot easier. So, so don't stress about it. All right, uh, I don't wanna get into this too much. Uh, the only thing you really need to know is that the more, the closer it is to your axis over here, the better the test is, right? Uh, so let me just do this. This is our area, on, so for the green line, this is our area under the curve. This is terrible. You get, you get what I'm saying? So everything that falls under here is the area under the green curve. The greater area under the curve, the better the test is, the more accurate the test is. So I have it in first aid. This is kind of all you need to know. If they give you a question on this, they're just gonna ask you, they'll probably put A, B, C, and say which one's the best test. The closer you are to the X and Y over here, um, the more um, uh, you know, the more of a right angle you're making up here, the better the test, because you have a higher area under the curve, greater area under the curve. Okay, and that's, that's what it says here. This is what defines it. They're not going to ask you to plot it out like in small group or anything like that. Um, you just need to know, be able to read it. All right, these are a pain in the butt too. So we got this. The point of this is how likely uh, the test is. So again, they're, they're moving numerators and denominators and then 
putting out in words. But the probability that a test would be positive in a person with the disease over the probability of positive tests of a person without the disease. So that's in words saying what this equation is. What you really need to know is that if you have a higher number for a positive likelihood ratio, that's a good test, okay? That means your, your predictability of getting a positive test for a person with the disease versus a positive test for a person without the disease, which is not what you want, is good, okay? So you want a high number, you want a high numerator, okay? Um, if the wording's confusing, just remember, uh, if they give you a graph, uh, and the, the, likely, the positive likelihood ratio is the highest number, okay? Um, I think that's what they had in our test. They asked us what was the best, the highest likelihood ratio, and you just pick the biggest number for positive. Now, negative likelihood ratio, you could read that here, negative for a person with the disease uh, versus negative with a person without. So in this situation, a negative likelihood ratio, the lower number is a good test. So you're in the decimal point range. Um, did I put the graph? I did not put the graph, but uh, there, there was like a table. Again, the highest number is a good positive likelihood ratio. The lowest number is a good uh, negative likelihood ratio. Um, that's the easiest down and dirty way to do it. All right, and you can see that here. And I like this because it kind of gives you a little definition. This is again from that little, that little table in, in my additional resources with all the equations, okay? So decrease odds after a negative result versus, yeah. So you can see that here. All right, this was a little confusing. I'm gonna explain it to you the way I understand it. So for parallel testing, we're looking at increased sensitivity. So they use this in situations where it's an urgent situation. You can give multiple tests at one time, okay? Now, the thing about this is if you had a good test for either sensitivity or specificity, you wouldn't have to do this. You wouldn't have to do parallel testing. You wouldn't have to do serial. You can give one test, say definitively, take the hemoglobin H1C, you definitely have diabetes. But these are situations where nothing's really great. There's a lot of gray area. So if you give, if somebody comes in urgently or what, whatnot, and you can run a bunch of tests simultaneously, if any of them test positive, that correlates to increased sensitivity you're likely to have caught included the disease, okay? Now, serial testing, again, this is uh, a situation um, where none of the individual tests correlate to a very good specificity. None of them can definitively rule out the disease. So you use multiple tests in sequence to figure it out. So the example I would use is saying, uh, if you were using tumor markers, serum tumor markers, right? But they're all, um, they're, they're um, they're broad, they're, they're not specific. They're, you know, so these, these, um, these tumor markers are non-specific, right? But, um, so you run a couple of tumor markers, all non-specific, none of them definitively say you have the disease, but if all of them test negative, it, 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 it tells you, you, you probably don't have the disease, right? Hope that made sense. So think about it as tumor markers that, you know, like, uh, or it's like rheumatoid arthritis, there's a lot of inflammatory, uh, inflammatory markers that show up that are very nonspecific. They don't necessarily tell you you have rheumatoid arthritis, but they tell you you have inflammation, okay? So if all of these inflammatory markers are negative, well, you're showing that you don't have inflammation, so you likely don't have rheumatoid arthritis. But if one of these in sequence says there is inflammation, then it is possible, okay? So again, if it's still confusing, just memorize parallel increased sensitivity, serial increased specificity. But the thought process is here is none of these individual tests are great. So you kind of have to use multiple. All right, and this is in words. Yeah, increases sensitivity, you do them in parallel. And uh, obviously we, what I was just explaining, the sensitivity correlates to a high negative predictive value, okay? Uh, increased sensitivity means increase negative predictive value. And then here, um, specificity, and that correlates to your positive predictive value. That's your spin snout thing. And uh, again, yeah, like I said, none of these individual tests are really great. So you do, you work with what you have. All right, let me read that here. Um, okay, so probability versus odds. We'll look at this. So probability, remember, it correlates to everything. 
So, um, and odds is you correlate to positives over negatives. So it's, it's more of a ratio where risk is um, like, uh, like people with the disease over the entire population and odds would be people with the disease versus people that don't have the disease. Okay. Um, just in case they ask, uh, it would be good to know which of these tests are more valid. Remember meta-analysis meta takes, takes data from a bunch of different research papers and, and, and sites and, and puts everything together. So uh, just knowing which one's easy points, if they give you a list and say, which is the most valid, you always wanna go with meta-analysis. And then um, observational studies obviously aren't as good as experimental designs because experimental designs, you could design it around what you're actually testing. Okay, so just knowing which ones are better, which ones show increased validity, um, we'll get you points on that. All right, so I'm explaining this the simplest way as possible. Um, I think Dr. Randess, the way he kept harping on the idea of this, you wanna determine whether we're looking, uh, are we studying the exposure or are we studying the disease? Okay, so for cross-sectional, we're going through, um, we're just looking at a one snapshot in time, right? You're actually looking at the exposure and the disease together concurrently, okay? So you're just gonna analyze everything at a single period in time. So it kind of explains here, collection relevant data at a specific point of time. So this is the easy one, okay? Exposure and disease together. Now, if we were looking at a case control study, um, you can see here it's retrospective. So case control, you start with the disease, okay? Um, and so we're saying, you know, lung cancer. We're starting with lung cancer and we're gonna look back. We're gonna say, what was the cause of the lung cancer? So it may come down to smoking or whatnot. The point is in the stem of the question, they're gonna say, uh, we're looking at the disease and we're trying to go look back and see what caused the disease. So that's a case control study. That's all you really need to focus on. Are we talking about the disease? Are we talking about the exposure? You know, which one are we trying? Which one are we starting with and which one are we analyzing? So for case control, you're starting with the disease and you're looking at what could have caused it. And you can see that here. We're looking at these this disease, people that have it, people that don't have it. We're going back in time and seeing if they were exposed, who was exposed and who wasn't, what could have caused it, okay? So like mesothelioma, great example, right? That's that, you know, uh, uh, cancer from asbestos, um, you know, in the plural of the lung. So people had mesothelioma, first person that, first couple of people that come, came up with it, like, what is this weird cancer in the plural? And they had to go back in time. They said, what were these people exposed to previously, maybe 40 years ago, um, that could have caused it? And then they, they, they were able to whittle it down to say um, there was an asbestos exposure, okay? Now, when we do these case control studies, we can look at odds ratios. So um, I think the idea they won't act, they probably won't ask you to calculate this, but just to see if you could set it up properly. So they'll give you this and they'll say it's a case control study or they'll say they want the odds ratio and you just need to put it together. Remember A over C over B over D, once you flip it and reverse it, you get A over D over B over C. So that's gonna be your odds ratio. So it should be fairly simple. As long as you could set it up, you're good. All right, explains it here. Now, ecological studies are just um, in case they, I think we did have a question on this. Pretty simple. Are we we're talking about populations, not individual people? Okay. So when you're looking at populations, that's that's your analysis. Um, consider it ecological. All right. Now, these cohort studies, we're looking at the exposure first. Now, whether we look at prospective or retrospectively, it's the exposure we're talking about. Okay, um, so uh, people were ex exposed to cigarette smoke. There was, they've been smoking. What is the consequence? So you can go forward in time. Uh, you could say, okay, these people are exposed and you could follow them through time or you could go back in time, right? They were exposed to cigarettes um, or, or yeah, they were exposed to cigarettes and what was the consequence of that, right? So for these cohort studies, remember looking at exposure first. All right, so these people were exposed to cigarettes, right? What were the long-term consequences? So this is a 
prospective study, uh, what was the consequence in the future? You follow them and see what happens, right? Or like radiation, something like that would be a good one. Um, Chernobyl, right? They were exposed to it, follow them over the next couple of years, see what develops. And then when we look at these cohort studies, that's when we talk about relative risk. So again, you need to know these, but I think as long as you could set these up, um, you should be good. They'll give you the table. They'll ask you relative risk. Just plug it in and get it right. All right, again, relative risk. See that here. Then we can talk about some more definitions. Uh, attributable risk. So what is the incidence in the group versus uh, the incidence in the non-exposed group? So we could take that data and look at uh, what were the consequences. And then you could obviously put that into a fraction. So also you could do absolute risk reduction. So again, I, it, they're gonna have to make it very straightforward for you on the test. They're gonna ask you what exactly you're looking for. How do you calculate the absolute risk reduction? So we know that this is the case. Tributal risk is the EER or this minus the CER this. Just remember absolute means that you don't have a positive or negative. You don't have a value. Absolute means it's going to be positive. So it's either EER minus CER. It doesn't matter which way you do it because the negative value goes away. It's always going to be positive. All right. It's absolute. Okay. So it should be fairly straightforward when they ask you about this. Um, and as long as you know these equations, I think you'll be okay. All right. And then they do the number needed to harm uh, versus the number needed to treat. And again, you just need to know the equation, number needed to harm. Uh, I thought I had the other one. Oh, there's number needed to treat as well, which is one over the attributable risk. But number needed to harm is um, absolute risk reduction, okay? So these numbers actually do come out to be similar. It just depends, or the same. It just depends if they're talking about treatment versus harm. Okay, uh, we're almost done with this stuff. So don't get this. These are easy points as well. These randomized controlled trials, they go through different phases. So the initial phase, you're looking for safety. What are the side effects that could happen? Very small group of numbers. Then you can increase to phase two um, and you can get more people. Um, you're looking at the efficacy. So you're starting to look at the dosing rate and stuff like that of the drugs. Then you go to phase three, you get a lot more people. So you're looking at differences in um, side effect profiles, right? With more people. Then it goes to market and phase four is post-market. So post-market, you're trying to see, you know, once you have millions of people or hundreds of thousands of people, um, is, did anything erratic happen? You know, the increased numbers should show increase, um, you know, any variability there. So just make sure you can determine if they give you uh, one of these controlled trial phases, you can uh, you could put it where it needs to be. Okay, we did have a question about this. This should be pretty straightforward. When you do this crossover study, you do treat both, um, both groups. So you start with one, the other becomes your, um, your control. Uh, there's always has to be a washout period where the drug or medication that you're using or whatnot uh, has to get out of the system and then you switch, all right? So this is this uh, randomization type uh, trial, but even though you randomize it, both, both groups get treated, okay? Okay, now I could go through the biases, but I think first aid does a really good job of it. Um, it they are close together and some of them are tricky. My advice would be to have a good um, example for each. I think some of these examples are better explanations than the actual definitions. So if you have an example that makes sense in your head for these different biases, um, you should it should be the same on the exam. You should be able to do that. So uh, read through these in first aid. This is what they have. And if you can understand the different um, explanations or I'm sorry, or the examples, then you should be good to go. Okay, um, that's all for that. Hope that wasn't too bad. Does anybody have any questions? I did my best. <laughs> okay, so um, I have had the pleasure of meeting a good number of you guys already down here. 
I'm on the island. It, yes, from my tan, you can see. Um, for wow. those who haven't uh, left yet, I certainly look forward to it. If y'all have any questions, y'all should message me. There was a couple of things like I had all my I's dotted and T's crossed and it was still stressful. Um, so if y'all have any questions, um, a few things like make sure you look at that pre-checklist and print everything out. Um, you need to have all that printed because at some point they will ask you to look for it. You don't wanna have to pull it up on your phone. So print everything. Um, the thing about the PCR test is like the 72 hours, some places are real sketchy. Like they, they'll say they should get it in 72 hours, but they it's like close. So I just went ahead and paid for a rapid PCR. You get same day results. So insurance reimburses you most insurances, but I had to pay like 225 up front, but I had, I, I had my results in an hour, but you have to have a PCR. I'm not talking about the antigen test. You have to get a rapid PCR. So you just have Google, to say PCR. You Google a place around you um, and there's labs that'll do it. I had to just schedule an appointment. I just did it the day before. So I was able to show up at the airport with all of my paperwork. Um, they're really yeah. strict with that 72 hour timeline. Like I've heard of people whose flights got delayed and it got delayed pushing them out of that 72 hours. And because yeah. it was like an hour or two hours or three hours, they wouldn't accept their negative PCR. And so just to let you guys be cognizant of that kind of thing, it might be worth it to go and do the rapid PCR because if just, yeah, peace, of it, mind, peace of mind is everything. Honestly. Yeah. Um, I got, okay. So I landed, uh, I landed a Wednesday. Uh, I was in quarantine till Friday morning. So less than 48 hours. I had my results. They sent me a WhatsApp message like you're cleared. So, um, there's, was that also, um, make sure you get the, what's it called? Uh, the travel authorization form in as soon as possible. I sent mine in Friday. So you're supposed to do it 48 hours beforehand. I sent mine in Friday. I flew out Wednesday at like 6.30 in the morning. At like Tuesday at like five in the afternoon, I hadn't got it back yet. And I was like, oh my God, they're going to close it off, you know, office hours, or whatever. Come to find out they, they, they send you the authorization through the night, which is stressful because I was supposed to leave the next morning. So I contacted DOS and was like, can y'all look into this for me? So my advice would be get it in as soon as possible and follow up with them. If you don't get something within like that day, like 24 hours, contact DOS because they have like, they have a special email address they have and they're like, uh, get it. Yeah, they, so, but I was freaking out. But um, so keep up with that um, and should be good. Sadly, for those of you that don't know, I showed up with Phoebe at the airport and she was a little chunky. And so, um, they didn't let me bring her down here. They turned turned her away at the airport. I was like super bummed out. So she's staying with my mom. She's in good hands. But um, yeah, that was uh, that was a whole uh, whole mess. Okay, uh, y'all want? Oh, sorry. I have a direct message. Wait, let me. Yeah, uh, Lindsay's going to cover the healthcare stuff. There was some good, there a good bit of questions on it, but they were mostly definitions. Like the different it's Medicare. pretty straightforward. Um, so I'm when we get to the healthcare system stuff, I'm going to show you where you need to focus your attention because it is straightforward, but there is so much filler and intro in there to kind of just orient you that I picked out just what you need to know. And so I condensed those lectures by like a third, honestly. Oh yeah, and show up at the airport twice as early as you anticipate because there's no there's no automatic check in. Like you literally have to wait in line like the old days. So like the old days. The old days when we took boats places or something. Oh my All right, I'll be quiet. Go That's for entertaining. It. Oh, did y'all see my apartment? Look, I didn't decorate it. This is so, <laughs> look. <laughs> it's beautiful, isn't it? Oh, no. Thanks. Oh, now, now I'll be quiet. I'll mute myself. Thank you, Brady. <laughs> okay, so we are getting into some micro fun. So I organized this. I think I organized this how it shows you in your DLA roadmap thing. Um, or I don't know, maybe I did it and how it made most sense to me, but it's all here. <laughs> 
so this DLA, um, I picked out just these two things as you needing to know. This was the controlling growth DLA. Um, really the only things antiseptic versus disinfectants, antiseptics is to safe on tissue, disinfectants is not. And then big, big, big bacteria static versus bactericidal. One of them is just, one of them is going to kill bacteria and then one of them is just going to halt their growth. So this was definitely a question on the exam. The rest of this DLA wasn't very high yield. So I pulled out what you guys need to focus on for the short little DLA here. Okay, microbiome and biology, I spliced together um, things that you guys need to focus on. So this is more conceptual definition-ish. Um, I don't know how many of you, how extensive your micro background is, but um, you know, you have commensal flora pretty much everywhere, skin, gut, you have bacteria everywhere. It's ubiquitous. Ubiquitous just means everywhere. Um, very high numbers in oropharynx, large intestine, absent in non-epithelial mucosal lesion locations. So blood and CSF are sterile. I'm going to repeat that in a minute, but that is important to know which locations are sterile versus which locations you are going to find commensals, um, because that's, that is important in diagnosis. And then loss of biodiversity is dysbiosis. Again, all of this information right here is more conceptual than anything. Um, understand the concepts and um, put it in your brain for later. Specimens, I condensed this down. Um, burns and wounds, you have a lot of commensals on the skin. So it's important to get an aspirate versus just a swab because a swab, you're going to get a lot of commensals that are going to contaminate your um, specimen. So you want to get an aspirate. And the biggest thing here is risk for MRSA, methicillin resistant staph aureus. Um, so that's a very important consideration when you're talking about burns or superficial wounds. That's um, the MRSA is a high yield point. Oropharyngeal swabs. Um, the biggest thing here I remember is pharyngitis and strep pyogenes. Strep pyogenes is a big commensal in that area. Um, or no, it's not a commensal, but there are commensals, but pharyngitis is caused by strep pyogenes. So I remember a question about that. So know that that location, you're gonna find that. Sputum, um, you're not going to have commensals here. This is where you're going to do diagnosis for pneumonia, tuberculosis, um, mycobacterium tuberculosis is the causative agent of, tubercul of TB. And so um, that is when, that's the process where you have to make sure that you are just getting sputum and not the oral secretions because then you can have cross-contamination. Fecal, a lot of commensals, colitis and gastroenteritis. Big, big, big thing is salmonella. We'll repeat that in a bit um, because you can differentiate between foodborne illnesses um, with different agents. Then um, bladder, is your, bladder is usually sterile, but you can get contamination. Blood is sterile, CSF is sterile. And so just understand sterile versus commensals. And then I put um, this from your slides on here. Um, you, it is very important to understand these concepts because when you are testing the areas, when you're identifying, um, you need to know the composition of the area. Prokaryotic biology, this is more for completion's sake and review. Um, I think we've all been hit over the head throughout undergrad and throughout term one of eukaryotes versus prokaryotes. So this is more for completion's sake. Um, a big thing here, a new piece of information, the antimicrobial resistance genes, the AMR genes, this is one of those um, virulence factors that uh, the prokaryotes are going to have. And so that is important to note there. The slide on the right, um, this is more conceptual introduction. Don't memorize these entire slides, look at it, understand it, and then move on because this will help you later in the more testable information. But the big ones are the gram positive and gram negative. Yes, you will be tested on the gram stain method. You need to know the significance of each step. 
what does each step do? So first you have crystal violet, then you have the alcohol or the iodine, then the alcohol, then the pink saffronin. You need to know what these do. So you have the application of the crystal violet and then the iodine is the mordant, then the alcohol decolorizes and then you have the counter stain. So you need to know those definitions. It is extremely high yield. You will have a question on it. And I heard so many people say, oh, I didn't look at this slide closely enough or this closely enough. Um, it should be an easy point or two on your exam, but please, please, please um, don't pass over this slide. So does anybody need um, a little more, need to go over this process or is it, does it make sense? Do we need to talk about it in depth? We can talk about it. You got the iodine. What is it like? Does that just like kind of help the color get held inside the cell walls before it gets washed away? Yes. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we can move on. Oh, big, big, big. This this seems really weird, but you always kind of forget it. It's such a small, simple concept, but it's huge. Gram positive is purple, gram negative is pink. So don't forget that because I'm. Um, that's such an easy thing to forget if you don't always remind yourself of those smaller little details that are really important. Okay, gram staining, what's the basis? It is the peptidoglycan. So this is why you get gram negative versus gram positive staining. It's why you have the dye held into this, held in the cell versus not. So a thick peptidoglycan layer, remember that crystal violet is the first step in your gram staining process. So if you have a thick peptidoglycan layer, layer then it's not going to exit the cell when you decolorize it. So it's going to stay versus if you have a thin peptidoglycan layer, it, it, the crystal violet is going to wash out. And then when you do the counter stain, the cells that are empty of stain are going to take in the crystal, are going to take in the pink saffronin, and then it's going to stain pink. So that's why you are getting the difference in color of the um, grand stain. It's the peptidoglycan which is a monomer um, composed of NAM and NAG in, the, um, in pentapeptide chains. Um, I put this in here, this is really more concept conceptual, the process of this, but it's very, very, very important that you understand the application of farm, of farm here. And so the big thing that keeps coming back are the beta lab lactan drugs. And so please highlight that, understand why it's important. Um, I mean, the bactoprenol is the one that shuttles from the cytoplasm into the periplasmic space. Transpeptidases or the PPPs catalyze the incorporation of the monomers. And um, these PPPs are a target for the beta lactam. So that is very, 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 very high yield. So start that slide. Um, note it because you will most likely be tested on it and you need to understand why that's important. Horizontal gene transfer. This is a small DLA that her, no, actually it was our flipped, this was our flipped lecture. I had to go to so many sources to understand this process. So I, through practice questions and horizontal gene transfer, you have three, transformation, conjugation, transduction. The big point, transformation is transfer via free single-stranded DNA, conjugation is via pillus, and transduc transduction is via a phage. We are going to go through each of them based on what it has on your slides, but just know that this is the big point. This is, if you break it all down, this is actually what's going on. And um, this is how they can phrase it in a question if they were to ask you about this. So um, they opened it up with the Griffith experiment. This is just the example that they use. And so you have the smooth colonies, have a capsule, they are virulent. You have the rough colonies, no capsule, they are not virulent. Heat kill the um, virulent ones. And so they are dead, but they're not destroyed. Then you have the live cells. And so it's basically just proving this that, oh yes, there is transformation. So pieces of DNA via transformation, um, when you mix with these killed cells, 
um, these live cells become smooth virulent because they're gaining the capsid. And the reason they gain this capsid is through the process of transformation. Again, this is more conceptual. Um, what it's really honing on here is that this is kind of proving the existence of transformation of these gene products so that another cell, another organism takes up something. So that's what's going on here. Um, transformation. So kind of just talked about that. You have the donor smooth colonies that are killed. You have the recipient colonies. And then um, by the process of, um, so the capsule gene flanked by, I'm sorry, I just got ahead of myself. Let's go back to number two. Um, they uptake the free DNA. So the recipient has the machinery to uptake the DNA. That DNA is then flanked by um, uh, colonies, then you get homologous recombination, and then that's how it's incorporated in there. Again, more conceptual than anything. Conjugation, donor bacteria has a plasmid with this AMR gene. Remember I said to highlight that one because that's a new um, thing that you probably haven't heard of prior to this. Then you have the donor bacteria, which transfers this AMR gene to the recipient. And this is via conjugation pili. Again, that's the big point here. And then the recipient has the AMR gene. Then you have transduction. You need to know the difference between lytic and lysogenic. Lytic is an active viral replication. Lysogenic is incorporates and it's dormant. That's what it is. And so big thing here, know the difference between the two. Um, that's the big kicker. Gram positive versus gram negative, gram positive thick pe pe peptidoglycan, tychoic acid, lipotychoic acid, that yes, that is extremely important to know which components are in each because they'll put, okay, what's the component of the causative agent? And they'll put tychoic acid, lipotychoic acid, and then they'll put um, lipopolysaccharide. And so you need to know the components of each of these bacteria. It's very, very, very important. Gram negative, thin peptidoglycan, they do have the periplasm. Outer membrane with LPS, this is extremely, extremely important. You have the three units, so the O antigen for attachment, core polysaccharide, lipid A, star highlight underlying lipid A, very important component of this. This picture that I put at the top where it says parts of the LPS, I would know it. Hint, hint, wink, wink. I remember that being something on our exam, but you do need to understand that lipid A has a toxic effect. Um, LPS itself, the entire thing functions as an endotoxin. This creates inflammation that causes sepsis. So that's the big thing. We'll talk about the terms endotoxin versus under one, other ones, but just know that LPS is an endotoxin. That's probably one that, uh, term that I would highlight as well here. And then another component of gram-negative bacteria, you have the porin. So this is an extremely important slide. You'll get two to three questions right on the exam if you just know the difference between gram-positive and gram-negative. Optional features. This is another picture that I would memorize. I remember put it, um, having to differentiate structures on here in a question. So hint, hint, wink, wink, memorize that. So you have flagella, which is motility. The examples they give you are salmonella and shigella. Capsule, this is a big one. Um, it's on another slide, so I'm not gonna hit that point home right now, but this helps the organism resist environmental and immunologic um, insults pass through transformation. Capsule is a big one. So adhesions, you have fimbrae, which are numerous and short, pili, few and long, and then you have a sex pili for conjugation. That's a single one. Um, I would note the difference between all of these. So fimbrae are numerous and short. So if they pointed to something as like, what is this? You can say, oh, this is the fimbrae. So I would know those. Secretion systems. Um, I don't remember this being a huge, huge thing. Just understand that this is the process by which you can release exotoxins and enzymes. Type three secretion system um, acts as a needle to inject proteins into a host. Just know that. Phages, this is a virus that infects a bacteria. And then spores, these are highly resistant to desiccation. The big thing here is the dipocholinic acid. Highlight that um, this is the importance of the spores in making sure that they can be um, highly resistant. 
Commensal versus pathogen, these are mostly, mostly just definitions. I put this on here for completion's sake because these terms do come back and knowing them is a really important thing. So commensals, we talked about that. Those are endogenous. Pathogens are exogenous. Opportunistic, kind of self-explanatory, I, I would think. So, you know, if there's an opportunity, they're going to go for it. So this in opportunistic um, infections, these are where bacteria that are normally kind of kept at bay through the commensals, they're like, oh, okay, we can now overtake the system. And so immunocompromised individuals, virulence factors contribute to infection. Whenever you see a virulence factor for any bacteria, know it. They love, love, love virulence factors. Um, on this slide, it's just a definition that you need to understand. And then pathogenesis, just the mechanism that you get symptoms. Again, this slide, really just definitions. You do need to understand these moving forward though. Again, just be familiar. I would understand this process. So this is just the disease process. You have inc incubation, prodromal. You have the actual illness and decline and convalescence. Um, so I, I don't know, does, is this confusing to anybody? Do we want to go through this entire process? This was more conceptual than anything. Okay, we will move on. Okay, this is really important. Bacterial products, biofilm, attachment, and colonization. I spliced all of this together so you get the big money points and um, then you can kind of move on. So the biofilm, this is what causes a lot of trouble with, um, you know, prosthetics, um, prosthetics, um, implanted prosthetics. And this is, these, this makes the bacteria associated with a biofilm, highly, highly, highly resistant to anything. So biofilm is very bad. Enzymes for invasion and dissemination. I would um, memorize protease hyaluronidase hy 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 okay. and collagenase. Just the fact that they are enzymes that break down host tissues, they could give you something and say which, which of the following would aid in um, invasion of host tissues. And you need to know that it is these enzymes that are doing that. I told you that capsule is very, very, very important. This prevents phagocytosis. They love this point, but they are so antiphagocytic. These, if a bacteria has a capsule, it's pretty bad because they can evade the host um, immune system and cause a lot of havoc. And so they like uh, oh, and this is really important. Asplenic individuals highlight that. I, I neglected to do that when I went through this. Highlight this, underline it, star it. High risk of infection with asplenic individuals. Um, this is very, very, very important. Endotoxin, this is what I was talking about and the different terms. An endotoxin um, triggers a robust immune response. So this isn't directly affecting the cells. This is causing a response that is going to lead to damage because as you are going to learn throughout T3 and T4 is that too much of a good thing is a very bad thing and the immune system is good, but too much inflammation is a very, very, very destructive process. And an endotoxin can um, kind of potentiate that inflama inflammatory process and get damage. So it's not direct cell damage. It's kind of indirect cell damage due to inflammation and that process. Um, LPS, again, I mentioned that before, LPS is an endotoxin that is on the gram negative bacteria. So understand that super antigen. I looked this up because I didn't understand the slide. So, um, you get a cross linking of MHC2 and the TCR. What this is, it's a specialized pathogen that fools the immune system and causes a non-specific activation of T cells. You get a massive cytokine release and this entire process bypasses antigen presenting cell processing. So I looked that up because I didn't understand, um, but there it is for you. Cytotoxin, this is more direct cell damage. So cyto cell, direct cell damage. Um, and you are going to get the inflammation down the line, but this is actually going to disrupt the cell membrane versus the endotoxin, which just triggers the immune response. The cytotoxin is actually going to cause cell damage. 
Um, but those concepts come heavily into play more into term four. AB toxin, um, you have an active and a binding subunit inflammation. I don't remember this being one of the big ones, but I put it in there uh, for completion's sake. Okay, now we get into metabolism and respiration. There are a couple things on here that are extremely high yield and you need to pay attention to. This slide is more just definition. So, you know, aerobic respiration in presence of oxygen, anaerobic lack of oxygen, and then fermentation, absence of oxygen. And um, you're using the fermentation process. So again, more definitions. Um, clinical relevance. We can use metabolism and respiration for di diagnostic procedures. So for example, E. coli in the urine converts nitrite, nitrate to nitrite. Remember we said that in the urine, the bladder is supposed to be sterile. You can get a UTI from invasion of E. coli from the distal urethra. And so how can you maybe know that you are getting an E. coli, a, a UTI and it's caused by E. coli because you get this reaction, you convert nitrate to nitrite. And so that is a diagnostic tool right there. Oh, and then another point, um, this becomes big a little later on, or it's just good to know, Bacteria deplete oxygen and can cause anoxic conditions. And those anoxic conditions can cause further damage down the line. But for your purposes right now, I don't know that it's the most important thing. Bacterial replication, um, binary fission, it's a definition. Growth is exponential, exponential definition. So just understand these concepts. Um, they aren't going to trick you on this concept. It really is just you know, do you know it? So yes. Um, growth factors, temperature, and then pH. Know the ranges. This is very, very, very important. Know the ranges. Um, do spend a little bit of time committed to memorizing this because it will show up. And then some of these ranges are close to each other. And then you'll kick yourself in the butt in the exam when you didn't look at it for that minute longer. So make sure you do look at it. So the psycho, psycho files. Um, I always know this because like, I hate cold. And so it's like, oh, you're a psycho if you want to be that cold. So I know it's that because, you know, it's the cold. So they both um, start at the same range, but notice their, uh, the upper end of their range is different. Meso, um, human body temperature, and then thermo, hyperthermo. So, and then um, the acidophiles, neutrophiles, I'll, hmm, that's a hard one, <laughs> but know the ranges. Um, this is a lot on water activity. The biggest thing, honestly, is what I have in purple. Um, so halo tolerant, halophile, extreme halophile, um, and then the exception. So that's the biggest thing here. I wanted to put all this on for completion's sake. I spent a lot of time trying to memorize this and trying to understand the concept. But the biggest thing is you're talking about tonicity and that relates to the conditions with which the bacteria can thrive. And so the biggest thing is the halo tolerant, halophile, extreme halophile. And then um, like the Vibio species, that's a big one because of salt water. That's a really big infection that you can get in the ocean are those Vibrio. And so knowing that is a halo file, knowing that that is the condition with which, um, you, sorry, I was looking at something else, um, that you can get that. That's very important. Um, okay. This bottom part, I actually meant that for another slide. So I apologize for that. I'm pretty sure that I meant that for another slide. So yeah, I meant it for this slide. So we're gonna go here and go back and I'll fix that when we post it. Um, oxygen, this is extremely, extremely, extremely important. Um, the top part is more conceptual th that you get to ROS, reactive oxygen species, when you generate energy, you know, you have, and then you have enzymes, two enzymes that can break that down. So you have superoxide dismutase and then catalase. Um, and these are very important when you're talking about the growth condition. So I'm going to go back for a second because I put this little question in here 
when I went, went through lecture, she made a note about this, but so like patient comes in with an erythematous wound that is warm and raised, culture taken to identify the causative agent, which of the following biochemical tests will differentiate the suspected gram positive organism, and it's the catalase test. And so um, you can come in and you see up to the catalase test, it's all the same for staph aureus and strep pyogenes. So you can differentiate between the two by doing a catalase test. And that's what they're showing in this picture here is um, you're gonna get bubbling or not simple test, but it can differentiate if you are trying to find the causative agent for something. But the big one here, you need to know this. Um, yes, you need to know superoxide dismutase and catalase. You do need to know that. You do need to know the examples that are associated with that. I remember microaerophile being a big one that they like to test. Of course, any of these are fair game. So I would spend a little bit of time on this memorizing this entire slide. It's very important. Um, but of course, high oxygen content at the top low oxygen content at the bottom. If the bacteria can survive with different gradients of oxygen, you can see where it will grow in the test tube. Then the ability for them to survive depends on the presence or absence of these enzymes. So if you have all of the enzymes and you can handle oxygen, because if you're metabolizing oxygen, you're getting the reactive oxygen species, which is toxic, if you can handle that, then you can grow an oxygen. But if you can't handle oxygen, you don't have those enzymes. Of course, you can't grow in the high oxygen concentration part of the tube. So please know this. Growth media. Um, this is kind of a convoluted topic. Um, spend a couple minutes on it. The biggest ones that they like to hit are very specific ones for different diseases. So I um, put a little stunt, star, sun, whatever down here, the Lowenstein auger, this is mycobacterium tuberculosis, of course, TB, and then Thayer Martin is the Neisseria gonorrhea. Um, selective media versus differential. Selective, you're going to select for something and limit something else, whereas differential, you're trying to classify something. McConkey is something that you'll get into a lot later, but the difference here is that you are differentiating between E. coli and salmonella based on their ability to ferment lactose. So this is one of those things that you have a foodborne illness, you want to know what's causing it. You can't, um, you know, E. coli is a commensal salmonella is not. And so you played it on McConkey. If you get um, this change to yellow, you know that it's not fermenting lactose and this is your causative agent. So you probably do have some type of foodborne illness. Um, me coli can be a foodborne illness, but it is within commensals. Sorry. Um, and then um, different growth medias are going to select for different things. Um, nutrient auger, which non-fastidious, McConkey talked about that, blood auger, chocolate auger, auger. The biggest thing for the blood and chocolate are chocolate auger are the definitions of what they are. So how do you get the two of them? Hemolysis, I don't remember this being a big thing in term three, honestly, you'll get into it a little more in term four, but just understand that these are different varying um, degrees of hemolysis. So beta is complete lysis of the red blood cells in hemoglobin. Alpha is um, you're lysing the cells, but not really the hemoglobin. And then gamma is no lysis at all. And then there was a lot of slides dedicated to this. The big money here is what I highlighted in purple. So the top, this is the process of how you are getting this value. So you're basically doing different dilutions. Um, so you can quantify this on a plate or you can do a serial dilution. Um, colony forming units, that would be the biggest thing that you understand what a colony um, colony forming unit is. But when you're talking about the serial dilution, uh, you take the colony forming unit count from the plate, um, from a dilution plate that has, oh my God, Lindsay, this is the big money. How are you, so if you don't want to do this growth calculation, 
which I didn't, you can just do this, count the zeros. If you're working in log 10, you can just count the zeros. So if you, you know, you know, you need the colonies, you need the dilution plate, and you need the amount plated. Those are the three values you need. If you're working with log 10, count up all the zeros and you get it. So it's, there are six zeros, 10 to the negative six, easy peasy. You'll have a question on your exam. And if you understand this, then you can um, get it correct. So it looks complicated, it looks convoluted, but there's a, there's a trick to it. Um, so don't make it more complicated than it really has to be. You're really just um, quantifying the um, bacteria in the sample. Atypicals, um, this one was high yield. I will admit that to you guys. Um, do spend some time mapping this out. I mapped this out and so this the pictures I used are of my whiteboarding because I thought that the slides were convoluted, very convoluted, and it took me a while to organize it out. So I have done that for you. So this slide is more conceptual. Um, they are very slow growing. So the clinical presentation is often going to be over a long period of time, but the big stuff here. So first we have the actinomycetes, which are, um, uh, so these are form long branching filaments. That's the characteristic of the actinomycetes long branching filaments. Now, under that category, you have the Israelii and the Nocordia. Both of these are under the actinomycetes. The difference between the two, actinomycetes Israelii is gram positive and Nocordia is branching filamentous acid fast. Those are the difference between the two. So both Nocordia and Israelii are under the actinomycetes, but the difference between the two, because they look almost exactly the same, on a slide is gram positive versus um, the branching filamentous acid fast. So know the difference between those two is really I, um, the biggest thing here is the periodontal disease. They love to associate it with that. Um, so you get opportunistic abscesses in anoxic tissue. That comes back, we did say that the bacteria does utilize oxygen and it causes anoxic, um, it causes anoxic condition. So this is, um, that goes here. Sulfur granules, slow granulomatous abscesses. That's more of how you're going to identify the patient. But the biggest thing here is understanding it's periodontal, strict anaerobe, um, gram positive branching filamentous actinomycetes. Then um, nocordia, we said it's acid fast, which you get from the zeal Nilsson stain, um, branching filamentous, and then aerobic opportunistic abscesses. Again, how do you differentiate the two between the abscesses? We talked about that. And then I included this little snippet right here. The difference between the acid fast bact um, bacteria is the nocordia branching filamentous versus mycobacterium are the bacilli. That's really important to differentiate the two. So make sure that you can um, do that. Now, going into the other examples of the mycobacterium, which are all acid fast bacilli, you have three of them, tuberculosis, and tuberculate or however you say it. Um, so phagocyti phagocytized by alveolar macrophages, but you can't kill it. And so you get gran granulomatous formation around it because since it can't kill it, the system keeps trying to kill it and trying to kill it and trying to kill it. And you'll get all into that in immuno, but that's what you get. That's how you get the granulomas formed over several weeks or months. That's the um, immune system trying to keep going and keep going, keep going. Faculty of intracellular. Um, and leprae, two types, lepromatous and tuberculoid. Lepromatous is the far worse one of the two. Tuberculoid is kind of eh. Um, you're going to get loss of sensation with both of these. Um, big thing, obligate intracellular macrophages. They're going to go to nerve cells. Um, I would look at the pictures in your slides on this. I remember that being sort of a thing, but know that there are two types and the difference between the two. And then Marinum, this, this will probably be an easy one to recognize because they're going to talk about an aquarium. They're going to talk about swimming pool, um, something along the lines of a water source. So M Marinum, just um, associate it with a water source. And that's the biggest, biggest thing that is going to clue you in on M Marinum. And then mycoplasma, the big thing, no cell wall. 
if they don't have a cell wall, they don't have peptidoglycan, which means um, they're not susceptible to beta lactams. That is a huge thing, huge, huge, huge thing. Um, remember I said beta lactams is gonna keep coming back and keep coming back. Why do beta lactamases work? Because they're targeting those PBPs. I believe that's the acronym, um, but if there's no cell wall, then it's not susceptible to it. Then fried egg appearance, that's one of those things that is just going to help you with identification. There are three of them, M pneumoniae, this is walking pneumonia, so a persistent dry cough. Genitalium in the female, it's going to cause pelvic inflammatory disease, which it presents with vaginal bleeding and discharge. Male, you are going to cause urethritis, which is going to present with dysuria and discharge. And then ureplasma, you can get spontaneous abortions or a premature birth. Um, the biggest one on here, I would say, is M pneumonia. Honestly, that's the most high yield, but do um, be able to associate the other ones, be able to recognize the other ones. And then chlamydia, big, 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 big. You do need to know the difference between an elementary body and a reticulate body. You need to know which is infect infectious and which is replicative. So please, 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 please memorize that. <laughs> that, um, is a very, very, very important thing. Um, obligate intracellular doesn't gram stain. You need a host for ATP and NAD. There are a few of them. So C, um, trachomitis urethritis, you can get an STI, STD, um, and then cervicitis. Um, these are females without symptoms. And if you leave it untreated, it can progress to PID, pelvic inflammatory disease. Um, you will see intracytoplasmic inclusion on pap smear. Let's, okay, thanks, Brady. Smoke, oh my goodness. Okay, and then rickettsia, um, oligate intracellular, arthropod bite, multiple in endothelium at the site, so it's a local lesion. Um, the biggest thing, particular rash of the palms and soles, so it's kind of hard to read, I apologize, but um, hopefully Rocky Mountain spotted fever is easy for you to identify. Okay, that is micro. Are there any specific questions from micro? Sorry, I wasn't um, looking at the chat during this. Can you explain the cord factor? Cord factor. That I just saw it in the chat. It says you can't kill it because of the cord factor. Let me see. Uh, she said we don't need to know the cord factor. It's associated with the um, with the TB, um, and it's the yeah. They they said we don't need to know it um, until term four. Yeah, it's a virulence factor, but don't y'all talk. Y'all have like two or three lectures. We know they say them. this, but I don't trust them. <laughs> It's a big topic in term four, so uh, the whole TB thing. So yeah, uh, you're good. But Dr. Harrington yeah. loves loves virulence virulence factors. So um, it's a pain, but you kind of have to at least know the important ones. The the stuff that makes uh, the bacteria infectious or differentiates it from other bacteria for sure. Um, all right, halftime. Um, We'll take five minutes and then we'll do immuno. Feel much better about the immuno than the stats. So uh, hopefully y'all are in good hands. We'll see what happens. All right, five minutes. All right, let's do immuno, fun stuff. Um, yeah, I know this is new for a lot of people um, if, you, if you didn't take it in undergrad, but Dr. Ramos, her questions are very straightforward, first, second order type stuff, very definition based. So that's what I'm gonna focus on. I think I've explained this before. The way this is taught as an introduction is almost like reading every other page or every other chapter of a book. It's like they give you a little bit of information and then you jump from innate immune system to T cells to B cells and everything. So um, you can't really paint a full picture. So you're just kind of getting little snippets to kind of get the uh, general understanding because when you get to term four and you start talking about pathologies, um, it starts to all make sense. So that being said, um, let's do this. Okay, I just wanted to show you one thing real quick. 
The term three additional resources. Uh, um, if y'all go to my notes, obviously my con consolidated notes are here, like the definitions. Um, but also I put the Jeopardy, these are the answers. If y'all wanna just, these are super important. These are like pretty good, right? For the test, I would, I would make sure to know these, um, these different, um, these definitions, um, for sure, 100%, 1,000% do them. And then these key points too. This is, uh, she did this very quickly. We snapshotted these, uh, took a snapshot. So just make sure you know these two um, and that'll take you far. All right. Okay, um, all right, so, when we start out, we talk about uh, immunology, we have to branch into the innate immunity, uh, innate immunity versus adaptive immunity. So when you think of innate immunity, that is basically the same in all of us. There's no memory to it. It's kind of like, you know, if you want to think that the cells are kind of like the army, they're your first line defense. If there's any sort of infection, regardless of what it is, that's what's going to be uh, going to try to um, alleviate the problem, right? There's no uh, there's not a lot of, of, of premeditated thought. It's just like, let's get to the infection. Let's do what we can to uh, isolate it, to kill it, to, uh, um, to prevent it from uh, going out systemically, okay? So um, uh, uh, contrarily to, to that, the adaptive immunity is gonna be your memory cells, right? So this is gonna be like, when you get some sort of infection, uh, is your body able to make uh, these memory cells to be able to recognize it if it happens again. So this is uh, more of an advanced system. Um, these are when we talk about our B cells, our antibodies and our T cells and how they develop. So it's going to be more of a long, long-term response. So this is gonna be different between person to person depending on what you're exposed to, what vaccines you have and whatnot. So uh, the innate arm, again, we're talking about those phagocytic cells. We all know macrophages, neutrophils, uh, they're gonna go to the site of infection. A lot of times it's bacteria. Just when you think of bacteria, you just think of a ton of cells. Just you wanna just eat them up as soon as possible. Whereas viruses are kind of like a little sneaky, right? So you may need some sort of adaptive immunity to kind of counteract them. Um, so yeah, so the first line is always gonna be your skin, uh, any sort of physical barrier. And then the second line de defense is gonna be this innate arm, this innate, innate response to everything. So primarily you're thinking of your granulocytes, your neutrophils, basophils, uh, eosinophils, your macrophages, stuff like that. And then when we talk about um, the uh, adaptive immune system, it's uh, more of a long-term response. We have our cell mediated immunity, like our CD8 cells uh, and um, antibody mediated, mediated, so like our B cells and our plasma cells. So yeah, again, you get this, this memory formation. So if you get a virus one time, you wanna be able to recognize it if you get it again. So whereas the first time you get an infection, it may last this specific viral or bacterial infection, it may last two weeks. If you can develop memory to it, the next time you fight it off, you can knock it out in like three days. So, and there's a lot that goes into uh, the adaptive immune system because how does your body actually form this memory? How do you even recognize it? How are you able to form cells that are just floating around long-term to be able to uh, identify it? And we'll get into that. And y'all will get into that a lot more towards the final as well. So, as you would expect, the innate immune system is gonna be quick. You can respond to it in hours, whereas the adaptive immune system has to form this memory. Um, but as I said, when you have a response to, this, uh, to a repeat infection, the adaptive immune system is gonna be those memory cells that are like, okay, we've seen this already. We need to be able to address this. Um, and again, these lymphocytes, the lymph nodes are gonna be where these antigens and antibodies uh, come together and you're able to um, isolate it, right? So. I guess that's a good point. Let, let's let's look at this. And I just want this is very basic, but I, I want to make sure you understand. So, like the antigen is from the virus, right? So if we if we this or or sorry sorry so it's it's from the infection. So virus, bacteria, whatever, right? So if we say that the infection, let's say the, the virus is a car, the antigen could be like a tire or whatever, whatever the body can recognize 
uh, in the circulation, that's actually your antigen. And your antibodies are what the body makes in response to the infection, right? So like I said, the antigen, if the virus is a car, maybe the antigen is the tire or the brake light, or for instance, for COVID, they use the spike protein, right? So the COVID virus has these little proteins on the side and they developed vaccine to this. So you would consider these little spike protein uh, an antigen, okay? So the whole point is, if these antigens are floating around, the body needs to make memory antibodies. And by doing that, you can neutralize this complex. That's the whole goal, okay? So that being said, let me ask you this. If we, and hepatitis B is a good example for this. If you che check the blood and you're positive for antigen, what does that mean? That literally means you have, so in, in regards to hepatitis B, that means you have an active infection, okay? You can't have antigen parts of the actual virus floating around if you don't have an active infection. So what if I said you have IgM? What does that mean? Well, we, we know these are antibodies. And these IgMs are the first antibodies that are made. And we'll get into it a little bit more later. But this means there's an acute infection, okay? So let me just change colors real quick. If we say we check the blood, we're positive for antigen, and we're positive for IgM, all right? Patient comes in. You could tell the patient you have an active infection, right, because of the antigen, but you have also uh, started making antibodies, right? These IgMs, these are the first antibodies made. Now, what if you tell the patient to come back in a couple of weeks, your antigen's negative, IgMs are negative, but IgGs are positive, all right? You could tell the patient, since there's no antigens there, you, the virus isn't present, okay? You've cleared the virus, but and then, and then IgM isn't present, but IgGs are. So remember, this class switching is the change from one antibody to the other. So when you switch from IgM to IgG, you're, uh, you're showing long-term immunity. So your IgGs are long-term. So this is gonna be, so you've cleared the infection, but you've developed some long-term immunity. So for now, that's, that's gonna help you uh, understand this idea. Uh, so remember that IgM, in, in order to have this long-term immunity, this IgM to IgG process has to happen. And this is that, this, the phenomenon of class switching. Switching, okay, and then aid, if we'll get to that, but the aid is what aids in, in doing this. Okay, so the point I wanted to make is uh, you can actually take serum, you could take the different uh, components of this and look at the patient and you could see uh, what exactly is going on. Well, you could even say, well, well what, if, what if the antigen's present, so we have an active infection, but IgG's pregnant, a pregnant, <laughs> present. So not only is the antigen there, but why do we have long-term immunity as well? So that could be a sign of chronic infection. You've had time to develop these long-term antibodies, but you've also, uh, you, you still the, the antigen and the virus is still present. So with hepatitis, any sort of chronic infection can lead to liver disease. So these are the point, this is the point of understanding these differences in antibodies and whatnot. And we'll touch on it a little later. I just think a general overview kind of helps me piece things together. Okay, so as I mentioned before, these granulocytes plus the macrophages, there's gonna be our quick response, the innate system, the cells uh, of the adaptive system, your B cells, T cells, that's gonna be our memory. Again, antibodies, cytokines and complements go with both. They kind of tell everybody where to go um, and uh, when there's supposed to be an infection. And I'll touch on the important ones there. So we can break it down into, and this is important, this myeloid progenitor and the lymphoid progenitor. 
Mylo is going to include all your granulocytes plus your macrophages. Remember, monocytes float around in circulation. Once they get into tissue, they change into macrophages. Your lymphoid progenitors are going to, uh, well, they're going to be not only natural killer cells, but they're also going to be B and T cells. But we're looking at the innate system, which is in red here. So the, the natural killer cells are components of the innate system. Okay, this is from first aid. And this is what I wanna point out because I don't want y'all to get confused. Just because they're like, the fact that they're granulocytes versus agranulocytes doesn't determine whether they're myeloid or lymphoid, okay? Because in this myeloid progenitor, you have three granulocytes, but you also have macrophages, which are agranulocytes, okay? So don't, don't get that confused. The lymphocytes are B cells and T cells and natural killer cells. Also, don't get confused with the idea that myeloid is going to be the innate system and lymphoid is going to be the adaptive system. Because remember, these natural killer cells are part of the innate system. Okay, so you can't, you can't compartmentalize it that easily. Um, so of the lymphoid system, B and T cells will be adaptive, but the natural killer cells will be part of the innate system. Okay, and remember, when we talk about these granules, those are going to be important because uh, they help to... Um, determine what actually cell lineage is gonna develop, okay? And then um, those are actually gonna be what helps to fight off the infection in the innate system. All right, so uh, just a couple more definitions. If you think of the antigen, I like the example of think saying like the antigen's like a lock, right? So you have to make an antibody that fits the lock. So if the antigen is the lock, the epitopes would be like the little um, like the little parts that, that the key fits in, like the little ridges, right? So um, these epitopes are like the little pieces that stick off of the antigen that, you could, that your body is trying to identify. These, these, um, these very specific things that are to the, to the virus or the bacteria that you can help differentiate it from other things. Now you can also have haptins, which are very small molecules, but if they're added to a, a carrier molecule, then they can be identified as, um, as an antigen, okay? And then you could develop an immune response. So these are all little components that make up the antigen or can make up the antigen um, uh, that you can identify. Now, this is a super important slide and this is important not only for the antigen, but we think about it a lot when we look at the vaccines, okay? So it's very important and the size, is, size does matter. So the size that they like is 100,000 Daltons, okay? That's kind of the minimum size they like for to develop a vaccine because you want to develop a immune response to it. So if it's too small, they just, it just won't. Now, the dosing is kind of weird because you could say, well, you want a lot of it, um, or maybe not, right? You, you, depending on how virulent it is. But the idea is to get it intermediate. Too low of a dose, you, you might not mount a response and too high of a dose, you can develop a tolerance to it or you can actually convert it to an active infection. So uh, intermediate is kind of where you wanna fall in that range. Now route, if you consider uh, how vaccines are given, we usually do it uh, subcutaneously, sub-Q. So, and you could do also do it intraperitoneal. Uh, even intravenous, but ideally you do it subcutaneous. Complex composition allows for immunity to develop. If it's simple, it's gonna be similar to other things in the body and you won't be able to um, isolate it. So you want it to be complex. So anyway, the point is if they give you a question, I'm sure y'all came across some practice questions where they said, um, uh, you give this, this specific vaccine, it's 50,000 Daltons and you, you, know, you give it orally. Uh, would it work? And it's like, well, no, you're not going to mount a response because it's not large enough. Now, also remember, if you do it subcutaneously or even IV, you're going to get a systemic response. If you give it, um, if you give it orally, you're going to get a mucosal response. So typically, they like to give vaccines subcutaneously. Um, point being, make sure you know these because I'm sure y'all will get a question regarding that. Now, neutrophils, y'all remember from back in the day. Um, uh, they have five, like five lobes. Um, now, the main thing you need to know now is they have this, they cause a perlent discharge, right? Which is pus. 
anytime you see pus, that's dead neutrophils, okay? So that's a dead giveaway. They go through this, um, this phagocytosis process and this neutrophil um, extracellular trap, I believe, right? It helps to um, isolate the bacteria. So this is the first sign of some, usually it's bacterial, be, bacterial because that's how you get pus. So any sort of bacterial infection, you would expect neutrophils to uh, be the first um, um, white blood cell or leukocyte on uh, uh, response. Now, eosinophils, remember those, those are bilobe. Typically, we talk about these in regards to parasitic inf in infections. Um, they also do antigen antibody complexes with some of those. Um, uh, when you develop those, a lot of time, well, y'all will get into um, y'all will get into the immunology of like lupus and stuff like that. But for right now, I think it's important to know any sort of parasitic infection, also allergic reactions. People that have asthma classically have increases to eosinophils. Okay, but the point is, if somebody comes in and they're sick. And you're wondering why they keep, why they have weight loss, why they have this fever, and you get, you know, you know a CBC and you check the eosinophil, or you check the CBC and they have a raised eosinophil count, that could kind of lead you to a parasitic infection, okay? Or maybe there's some sort of underlying allergy going on. So it's important to know that. Um, another one, remember we talked about, I, I mentioned these granules, if you want to know these, specific, specifically major basic protein. That's kind of the characteristic ones they talk about. Um, with eosinophils. Basophils classically rolls in allergic reactions, okay? Why is that? Well, histamine, as you know, is a major player. Whenever you have some sort of allergic reaction, you get a histamine release. Those are these little granules in here, some of them. And when the histamine's released, it causes massive vasodilation, it causes flushing. And a lot of the uh, cell mediators can leave circulation um, like vascular permeability, so they could leave circulation and go to the tissue. Heparin's a blood thinner, y'all are familiar with that. Um, so it kind of helps with, with that process too. By thinning the blood, it helps with the extravasion of, um, of the mediators, okay? Mast cells, I put this in here for completeness sake. Um, similar to basophils, you could find them in connected tissue and stuff. Now, we could talk about the agranulocytes. Now, you could see that here. Um, and they're going to be mononuclear, right? So they don't have any, any bilobed uh, nuclei. Um, now, specifically, remember, macrophages, even though they're agranulocytes, they fall in the myeloid lineage, okay? And you know all about these. Uh, Y'all have learned this before. Depending on where um, the monocyte goes uh, into tissue, the macrophage is called something in different areas. So it's good to know those, but y'all have come across that already. All right, now. Again, Dr. Ramos's stuff is pretty straightforward when it comes to like uh, definition. So there's not a lot of crossover. Like you won't find certain cytokines or certain interferons in one pathway and in another. It's very delineated, okay? So for instance, interferon gamma, gotta know it, she loves that. Um, it'll come up on the exam. Uh, that's going to push the macrophage to your M1. That's the classic macrophage you would think of, pro-inflammatory. Th1 response, which we will get to in a little while. Um, and then it's also going to be an APC, which we will also get to, get to in a little while. Remember, Th1s commonly deal with intracellular pathogens, okay? So this all kind of paints a picture of what we're dealing with. Th1, intracellular once you get that uh, intracellular um, killing, then you can have an antigen uh, presentation to B or T cells. Now, M2 macrophages uh, may not have heard of before, but these are almost, these are, these are have an anti-inflammatory process. When you think of anti-inflammatory, IL-10 is a big one, okay? So the way I like to think of it is when the macrophage goes to M2, you really use IL-4 and IL-13 to kind of tell the macrophage to become an M2 macrophage. And then this IL-10 kind of promotes this anti-inflammatory. So too much of a good thing is a bad thing, right? So not only do you have to have inflammation, but you have to help have something to kind of calm it down. Now, T2 response does deal with parasites. So keep all these little things in mind, T1, intracellular, T2, parasites, stuff like that. Okay, IL-10, anti-inflammatory. And these things will come up again and again. Now, dendritic cells are 
underappreciated. These are the main players when it comes to antigen presentation. They have these dendrites. They can grab onto a lot of antigens. Um, they're like the tattletale, right? They can, they're going to go through circulation, find whatever's going on, and go tell the T cell uh, what's going on. CD14, I have a, there's a slide with what the, the different um, CDs you need to know. Uh, but yeah, so think of it as surveillance, right? They're the hall monitor. Um, so they're going to deal with uh, presentation primarily to T cells. Okay, now natural killer cells, where does it fall? Remember, you go into the lymphoid lineage, but they deal with uh, the innate immune system. Okay, so these are going to be important to know CD16, CD56, natural killer cells. Straightforward, they go and kill um, uh, things at site. And uh, I, I do believe they actually act as antigen presenter cells, but not as readily as other, um, other cells. Um, yeah, so the main ones you need to know in regards to antigen presenting cells are the dendritic cells and macrophages. And then also a little later on, these B cells can actually be professional uh, antigen uh, presenting cells. Okay, so they're going to internalize these antigens and they're going to be able to present them as well to other B cells to make antibodies uh, primarily. Okay, so keep those in mind. Um, and like I said, this is as you go on, this is going to come a lot clearer. This is they're just trying to paint a picture for you guys uh, to know what's going on. Now, some people use the um, well, first, let's for whatever reason, they, they want you to know this, that for MHC class one, you have three alphas and a beta two microglobulin. Just know it. For MH2, you have two betas, two alphas, right? Um, so this is kind of what sticks out, this, this, uh, this MHC complex, and it allows the antigen presenting cell to bind so that it, it could be um, you know, uptaken into the, um, um, the B cell or the T cell for uh, longer lasting immunity. Okay, so um, some people, well, I should, okay, yeah. So some people like the rule of eight. So MHC class one, I'll just, it's like uh, MHC one goes with CD eight and MHC two equals CD four, your helper cell. So two times four is eight, one times eight is, uh, Eight, right, so that's a good way of, of knowing it. Um, this is from first aid. Again, for whatever reason, they want you to know this. And you can see that little binding pocket, right? So in between these right here, this is where the peptide or the, um, the, the antigen presenting cell can present the antigen, right? And you can see kind of the different characteristics here. Um, yeah. All right, so let's go into the adaptive immune system. And again, this is a bit more complex. It takes time to develop this adaptive immune uh, response because you're trying to develop memory to it. So uh, you have to know the site. So both B cells and T cells are made in the bone marrow, but T cells will migrate to the thymus to mature. B cells will mature in the bone marrow, but then they leave to go to the lymph node uh, for antigen. That's where the antigens are presented to the B cells, okay? So you can either develop a memory B cell or the B cell can turn into a plasma cell where it's just pumping out antibodies, okay? Um, like I said, the T cell is gonna be the thymus um, and you're gonna develop these effector T cells or memory T cells. Uh, so similar to the B cells, it's just a, it's a different process which I'll get to after the midterm. Uh, in more detail. So you have these T helper cells, uh, the, the, C, the cytotoxic T cells are your CD8 cells. Those are gonna be with the cell mediated immunity. And then you have T regulatory cells, which we'll get into in a second. So this is the, this is the idea. You have this antigen presenting cell. It can present to either the CD4 or the CD8, right? So remember MHC2 is gonna present to the CD4, right? Two times four is eight. You will find MHC2 only on antigen presenting cells, okay? So these antigen, antigen presenting cells are gonna to present to the CD4 helper cells. And from that point, you can go through the process of developing effector and memory cells, right? So they're helping, right? They go through the process of helping the process of making this uh, differentiation to these other cells. Now, in contrast, 
MHC1 is found on all the nucleated cells. So it's gonna to present to the CD8 cells and these CD8 cells are going to be your cytotoxic T cells. So I like to think of the CD8 cells as like your Navy SEALs, right? They're, they're uh, able to go, and I think there's a slide on it uh, explaining it a little better later, but they are able to go and they attack intracellular things such as viruses. So that nucleated cells come to them, they say, look, something's going on. The CD8 cells take this information and they can go intracellularly. They can release the granzymes and kind of get out without being seen, right? Um, and here we go. So these T cell receptors are what sticks out of the outside. So the, of the CD4 cell and then um, the antigen presenting cell can present to this MHC class two. And again, for this, you're worried about extracellular and phagocytized cells, okay? Primarily think of extracellular. Whereas I said with the CD8 cells, Navy SEALs, they go intracellular, they dive into the cell, they figure out what's going on. These antigen presenting shell cells are just gonna present the antigen, uh, this extracellular antigen that they found to the class two and this TD4 helper cells are then gonna go through the process of making memory cells. Okay, and like I said, you can see the contrast here. This is what she's gonna test, Dr. Ramos is gonna test you on, right? So let me just go, go back, right? So class two presents the CD4, they deal primarily with extracellular things, okay? Cytotoxic T cells, CD8, deals with class one, they're gonna deal with viruses, intracellular problems, primarily viruses are intracellular, right? That's how they replicate. So these are like, like I said, like your Navy SEALs, okay? I had a question, Brady. Yeah, sure. So back to when you, on that one slide, you had the macrophages polarization. How does that, does that, that seem to kind of- Wait, I'm sorry, which slide? You, uh, the macrophage polarization where the M1, M2, you said the T helper one response with is the killing of intracellular pathogens, but I, I assume that T helper cells would- No, extracellular. The, yeah. T, T helper cells deal with class two, deal with extracellular. Right, but on your other slide, on the macrophages polarization, when you have, when it goes to the M1 macrophage, you says it's killing of intracellular pathogens. I just didn't know if they're somehow- uh, Okay, well, so we're, we're talking about two different things here. Uh, um, the, the macrophage, this is, we're, this is when we're dealing with macrophages, okay? So the macrophages can deal with, um, can deal, okay, so like these M1 macrophages can deal with um, intracellular pathogens. They kind of just eat them up. Now here, uh, when we're talking about this, we're talking about T cells. Okay, so these, these now, now we're not talking about macrophages, those M1 macrophages anymore. We're talking about T cell presentation. So at this point, the macrophage is, is gonna be the antigen presenting cell to the T cell. So let's say we take an M1 macrophage, it eats up the intracellular, right? And then it sticks out that antigen on its surface. It's gonna go and it's gonna uh, provide that antigen to the CD4 cell, okay? That extracellular antigen to this CD4 cell. From there, the CD4 can go make memory T cells to that. So it's just a different cell lineage. Okay, thank you. No worries. All right, and you can see here, uh, this is a nice little diagram. But so let's, again, we're just gonna harp on this point. MHC2 deals with T helper cells, right? These two, MHC2 presents to the CD4 helper cells. And from this point, we're releasing cytokines, okay? This process, this activated T helper cell can release cyto cytokines. Now again, I, I just like this analogy because you can kind of see the Navy SEALs here. MHC1, any nucleated cell, CD8 presentation to this cytotoxic T cell. Now the cytotoxic T cell has all the information it needs. It can go to the cell, it can attack intracellularly, could release these, put the bombs in there, the granzymes or the perforins and get out. And then the cell just kind of explodes. So it's pretty cool. Uh, Brady, just a quick question. Um, yeah. Could you differentiate CD4 and TCR? Um, I believe CD, the CD receptors, they're the ones that are um, responsible for recognizing the MHC classes and then the actual receptors that are on the T cells, are they responsible for then binding to the antigen? Yeah, okay, so uh, I might have a slide. Um, that, uh, so yeah, so they kind of work together. So the way I think of it is like, um, it's like the, C, the, the cell can bind. So, so take this one, for example, the CD8 cell. Any nucleated cell can go bind to the CD8, right? 
It's saying, I, it's saying, I am now binding to this CD8, right? And then from that point, it could kind of fit into the, the antigen, into the receptor. So like it's a two point docking system, okay? I don't think you need to go into it much more than that, but uh, yeah, like so, um, but yeah, you could kind of see like this, this cell has to, this, this, um, this antigen presenting cell has to first recognize this, C, this T cell as a CD4. So once it goes there and says, okay, I found a CD4, then it could dock the antigen into the T cell receptor. But it is a twofold process. It kind of has to go together, right? Okay, thank you. Um, now, again, T regulatory cells. The main thing you want to know here, like, too, again, too much of a good thing is a bad thing. So we need to regulate this response. You don't want this heightened immunity or any sort of autoimmune uh, response. So these T regulatory cells can also bind to antigen presenting cells. Now, the main thing you need to know here is that, again, our friend IL-10, IL-10 is gonna deal with uh, just numbing down the response, right? This anti-inflammatory response. So from that point, you can, get, um, you, you can get a decreased immune response to that, okay? And again, when y'all get to term four, a lot of this will make more sense, but you just kind of need to get the, the definitions down of what goes with what. What would you expect to see? Who would present to who? What, would, what are the CDs you would expect on these cells and whatnot? Um, now, again, this will ma maintain tolerance so, uh, so you don't attack yourself, again, so you don't develop any sort of autoimmune diseases. Um, this is super important. I, I seem to remember Dr. Reynolds not, not talking about it too much, but it is very important clinically because whenever, like I mentioned earlier with the eosinophils and the parasitic infection, whenever you get... Um, these are the, the percentage of white blood cells you would expect in circulation. So any variance on that would indicate some sort of infection. If you have increased eosinophils percentage, you would expect some sort of parasitic, parasitic infection. Increased neutrophils, maybe it's a bacterial infection, basophils, some sort of allergies. Um, lymphocytes could be some sort of virus. So it kind of points you in the right direction. Um, for now, knowing the percentages is fine. Uh, but clinically, it's just not exactly straightforward. They actually use the, the actual count to see where they fall in the range. But if you could kind of, I would definitely know these, these percentages. Um, I think we talked about it in FTM. Um, so definitely knowing uh, what the actual uh, true percentages is will be good. This is important, but it's not as daunting as you think. Um, CD45, you'll find on all white blood cells. CD3, you're going to find on all T cells. Now, T helper cells, you would expect the CD4, cytotoxic, right, CD8. Let's just review who's going to present to the CD4s, our MHC2s, right? Who's MHC2s, our antigen-presenting cells, such as macrophages, um, uh, those dendritic cells, maybe B, uh, B cells. Um, cytotoxic T cells, you would expect the CD8, who presents to them all nucleated cells with MHC1. So... Don't get stressed about the whys. Why is this happening now? Just kind of get down the idea of what's going on um, and you know, kind of definitions of who falls where. And again, regulatory, I added IL-10 here. So yet, would you expect the CD3? Yeah, it's a T cell, right? It actually has a CD4 as well. So you can consider it a helper cell, but it also has CD25 and IL-10. This is, you have to know this. Um, you'll see this a lot. Some, some lymphomas, B cell lymphomas, you get increase in these CD19, 20, 21. That's always representative of B cells. And then just for completeness sake, it, it's probably good to know that 16 and 56, natural killers and 14 and dendritics, okay? So um, just commit this to memory. If you learn it now, and know it later. So you're good to go. Just in case they throw a histology slide at you, make sure the eosinophils are bilobed. Neutrophils are supposed to have five, but obviously this is in three dimensions. So it's kind of hard to appreciate one, two, three, four, five, I guess. Lymphocytes, uh, remember the nucleus takes up. Uh, you don't really get a big cytoplasm there. Monocytes are kidney shaped. All right, and then basophils obviously have all of our um, heparin and histamine molecules. What do we find in eosinophils? Remember I mentioned major basic protein. Okay, now hematopoiesis is the process of making blood cells, right? So erythrocytes, we've talked about 
like this. Um, wait, did you? Yeah, obviously I'll do that. Um, back when y'all did hematology and, and, and stuff like that, y'all will get into that more in term four. But um, remember, red blood cells live about 120 days. That's how you do your hemoglobin H1C. That's why you can get three to four months. Um, a register of uh, patients, uh, glucose levels, and um, you're going to primarily phagocytize these in the spleen. Um, and so remember, they go through those sinusoids in the spleen and they have to bend. So older red blood cells, if they can't bend enough, they just lice, which is what's supposed to happen. White blood cells, depending on if they're memory cells versus, you know, those, those neutrophils that, uh, so neutrophils would go like a day because they just, they attack, the innate immune system attacks and then goes away. And then you have some memory cells that can last a long time. And then, yeah. All right, so just basic again, uh, B cells and T cells are both going to be made in the bone marrow, but T cells are going to go to be developed in the thymus. Secondary are going to be where you're going to have antigen presentation. Okay. Now the thymus is very interesting. I get y'all y'all get into the whole development a little bit later, but I'm going to break down the positive and negative selection thing for you guys. But just remember. As a child, you're gonna to wanna to develop a lot more T cells. Over time, around puberty, the thymus is gonna degenerate a bit, um, but the thymus is gonna be where these T cells develop. There's a blood thymus barrier. You don't wanna be exposed to um, just normal blood because they need to develop um, independently of any sort of uh, antigens that are in the blood. Um, and then secondary lymph nodes. The main thing that y'all are gonna be tested on here is know what lives where. So what lives in the cortex, that's where you're gonna find your B cells. Um, I think even a histology slide of this is fair game, kind of knowing what is what. Remember those germinal centers of those big round spots you can see. Paracortex, that's where your T cells are. And then the medulla um, plasma cells, right? So the developing B cells go to the medulla. All right, and in these lymph nodes, that's where you get antigen presentation. Everybody meets up. Antigens are presented, APCs present the antigens, and then those B cells primarily, or T cells can, uh, well, the B cells can develop antibodies, the T cells can develop uh, memory T cells, okay? Um, just in case, I feel like you should know this, this is just the process of the blood, or sorry, the lymph flowing through. Uh, so you obviously afferent comes in, efferent goes out, and that's the process. I seem to remember that there was a question, it might have been an IMCQ about what comes after the afferent, it was subcapsular, but um, just know that. All right, and then in the spleen, again, what lives where? Red pulp, red, red blood cells, white pulp, white, white blood cells. So those where your T cells are, those follicles that you find are going to be your B lymphocytes. And very importantly, uh, the marginal zone is where you're going to get antigens and APCs meeting. Okay, so make sure you know that. And then another, uh, y'all are familiar with the malt. Malt is kind of an umbrella term for the secondary lymph organs, bronchial, gut, skin. Uh, y'all are familiar with gallt, like payers patches in the ileum. Uh, those are going to be lymphoid tissue. So you can get antigen presentation there, these microfold or M cells. All right, so remember it's a three-part defense. Um, the first line is just going to be any sort of barriers, right, or, or that, that are formed. And then second line is going to be the innate system. From there, these are acquired or specific as our third line defense where we have our adaptive immunity. All right, so um, this response process, these PAMPs and DAMPs can are acting as antigens. So when these antigens bind to these uh, receptors, that's how they come in and you're able to develop antibodies to them, all right? And these toll-like receptors are gonna be what binds the antigens on the outside of the phagocyte. So this is still the innate immune system. Uh, these toll-like receptors are gonna stick out and then um, the antigen can bind that. From that point, so this is extracellular binding. So you're thinking those, like those M1 macrophages, uh, this extracellular binding, and then it can be taken in and it can be processed. Now, the processing of this may involve um, sticking it back out as an antigen presentation, but it needs to be brought in first to be processed. All right, and you could see the whole um, phagocytosis process. So again, you could see 
kill the back. So two goals, one, kill the bacteria, and two, can we find something unique to this bacteria that we could present so that we could identify it easier next time? And that's the point. All right, and again, these phagocytes are gonna be your neutrophils and your macrophages. Uh, opsonization is an important process. You're kind of tagging the cell to be destroyed, right? So these uh, um, primarily C3B is gonna be the one that you talk about a lot, but if you uh, if you can tag the anti um, if you could tag the uh, the um, the infection of interest, so the bacteria or the virus of interest, then you can kind of tell it. You know, it reminds me of the eye cell disease where you where you tag it with mannose six phosphate to be destroyed. This opsonizing process, you're kind of like tagging it, telling the, the, it to be phagocytized. Okay, so it's just uh, an efficient process of of uh, identifying it and getting rid of it. So again, the main one you wanna focus on the C through B, that's gonna be your opsonizer. Um, I feel like the questions will be straightforward if they bring that up or some sort of C three B deficiency, whatever happens, you can't opsonize the cell. All right, now there's phagocytic, phagocy phagocytic killing, right? So you have oxygen independent. If you're not dealing with oxygen, you're primarily dealing with some sort of enzymatic response. So lysozymes, so things like lysosomes, lactoferrin, I think you find that in the mouth, in the saliva, and these proteolytic enzymes. So you're not using oxygen, um, mostly um, enzymes. Now there is the oxygen, you've learned about this already too, this oxidative burst, um, NADPH oxidase, uh, this comes into play when you talk about like um, G6PD deficiency, right? That process of like making NADPH oxidase, but there is an NADPH oxidase deficiency that you need to be aware of. What you're worried about is ca catalase positive infections. I don't know that you need to know the reason, but if you're curious, um, these catalase positive infections, uh, they actually use the host um, hydrogen peroxide. And so if you have this deficiency, you can't kill them properly. It's probably not important. The whole important thing is that um, these catalase positive infections are what you're worried about because you don't have um, a response. You're not able to kill it uh, because you can't develop hydrogen peroxide. And um, the big thing, I put a star, uh, which reminds me, uh, I would not doubt that you get at least one question. I think we've got at least one question from each of the diseases um, in uh, immunology. So uh, make sure you know those, you can identify those. They're all in the slides coming up. So make sure you know. So chronic granulomatous disease deals with NADPH oxidase. Now, why does, why does that make sense? If you, if you can't kill the cell with, with hydrogen peroxide, you don't have NADPH oxidase, you can't, you can't kill the bacteria, right? So the only thing you could do is make a granuloma, okay? So the idea is that if this is our bacteria and you use you know, NADPH uses hydrogen peroxide to kill this bacteria, right? It's supposed to kill it. Now, if this, if this doesn't work, right? The only option for you is to take that bacteria and form a granuloma around it, right? That's what a granuloma is. You're saying, I'm not able to kill this bacteria. The only thing I could do is wall it off. So a good example, now not an example of the NADPH oxidase problem, but the, an example of granulomas is tuberculosis, right? It's very hard to kill tuberculosis. So what the body does, it tries to wall it off. It makes a granuloma around it, kind of isolates it. But it's good to know because that'll help you remember that um, if you have an NADPH oxidase deficiency, um, you're prone to forming granuloma. So you have chronic granulomatous disease. You can't kill the bacteria, you have to wall it off. That process of walling off is making a granuloma. Okay, and definitely know this too, this uh, nitro blue tetro tetrazoleum test, know that in chronic granulomatous disease, you don't have the hydrogen peroxide, so you can't convert the yellow to blue. So in chronic, chronic granulomatous disease, it stays yellow, okay? All right, another good one that you need to know is Chediak-Higashi syndrome. 
So uh, this is the problem in forming the phagolysosome. So after the macrophage or whatnot, the phagosome uh, engulfs the cell. Uh, it has to fuse with the lysosome because the lysosome has the enzymes to break everything down. So if you can't do that, uh, you're not able to get rid of the, the, the particles that you ingest. So I think the main thing to know is how they present albinism, neutropenia, periodontal disease, and recurrent pyogenic infections. Now, do not get pyogenic and pyrogenic confused. Pyrogenic means fever. Pyogenic, like this here, means bacterial, right? So these go together. Make a note of that. Um, anytime you're gonna have neutropenia, you're gonna have recurrent pyogenic infections. Why is that? Because neutrophils are gonna kill these bacteria. Neutrophils form pus, right? So if you don't have neutrophils, you can get these pyogenic infections. Now, ideally, they'll tell you on the test, the person has albinism, right? Decreased melanin production. I don't actually know why that happens um, in these patients, but um, if they tell you that, dead giveaway right there, okay? Cool. Now, we could break down the inflammatory response. Y'all are familiar with this. Remember histamine, usually it's released in, as an allergic reaction from those basophils. Uh, this vas vasodilation, vascular permeability, uh, that's what causes the redness and the heat production uh, and the swelling. Uh, also uh, with the swelling, uh, bradykinin uh, stimulates pain, but also causes vasodilation, so the swelling. And we'll look at that when we talk about um, the angioedema in a second. And then resolution, obviously through the process, macrophages eat everything up and your lymphocytes will be your long-term for your memory cells. Super important here to know what goes with what. Selectins go with the rolling process. Integrins go with the activation process and these CAMs go with adhesion. So they could ask you a simple question, they could say, the body, the patient is deficient in selectins, what process is inhibited? The rolling process, okay? Or integrins activation. So easy points, just make sure you know what goes with what. All right, leukocyte adhesion deficiency. So uh, again, starred, this is very important, this beta to integrin subunit. So um, yeah, these neutrophils cannot get out of circulation and fight, and, and fight infection. So somebody tell me, all right, so this is what you're gonna be looking at, these home, I might have actually just highlighted, hold on. Um, yeah, so recurrent skin infection, delayed umbilical hernia uh, separation, that's a dead giveaway. That's like albinism with Shadak Kagashi, right? If they say delayed umbilical separation, we're talking about this. But can somebody tell me if you got a CBC, what would the neutrophil count be? Anybody? It would be high. It would be high. Why is it high? Because your body ca is causing more production of them because it can't get to the infection. So it causes like mass hyperplasia of it just to try and get them to the site of infection. Right, exactly. So if we look at the vessel, remember CBC, we're checking the, the cells in the blood. If we have all these neutrophils, it's not a problem making neutrophils, it's a problem getting the neutrophils out to the site of infection, right? So if we have an infection up here, um, these neutrophils can't get out. So I don't want y'all to get confused. The point is you will get increased neutrophils here. Um, you just can't get them out of circulation. So yes, you're constantly making more, trying to fight the infection, you just can't get to it, okay? So that's important to know. I don't want to get tripped up on that one. All right, so yeah, recurrent skin infections. Why? Because you can't get the neutrophils out of circulation to get to the bacteria on the skin. And then why, big giveaway here, why absence of pus? Neutrophils make pus, right? Those purulent infection, the pyogenic infection, that is pus formation. So if you can't, if you don't have neutrophils, none of that. All right, good summary here. The thing I want to, Oh, okay, I have that twice. Uh, thing I wanna point out here, um, very important, and this will come up again and again, acute inflammation, sorry, let me do it this way. Um, 
acute inflammation is going to deal with IL-1, IL-6, tumor necrosis factor alpha. I added IL-6 there to your notes, okay? Um, let me just do this because this helps me um, just going forward this. So I would always get these confused, tumor necrosis factor and transforming growth factor. So this has necrosis in it, right? This N and this has growth in it. Okay, so anytime you have some sort of active infection, this bad boy is gonna come first, right? Whenever you're going through the healing process, that's where you're gonna to get to uh, transforming growth factor, okay? So that'll help you going forward. Um, Y'all may not have come across TGF yet, but that helps me. So again, um, acute inflammation. We're talking about IL-1, IL-6, tumor, uh, tumor necrosis factor alpha. You should wake up in the middle of the night and say that. Also, uh, any time of chemotaxis, particularly these neutrophils, IL-8, that's, that's our neutrophil chemotaxis, but um, IL-8, LTB4 and C5A are gonna be dealing with that. So write it down a hundred times if you need to, make sure you know those. Um, IL-8 is primarily going to be neutrophils, but these are all gonna be chemotaxis. What is chemotaxis, right? Chemotaxis is there's an infection, say in your skin, you have these agents, you have IL-8, LTB4 and C5A gonna be released. It's gonna tell the neutrophils that are in circulation or whatever to go out of circulation to the site. So it's like, it's like a pin when, you, when you're sending somebody uh, your location, right? A location of infection, you just pin it and they could find out where to go. All right, so this kind of breaks it down. Again, uh, uh, this is gonna be your chemotactic factors, right? IL-1, 6, tumor, uh, necrosis factor alpha, gonna tell you that there's an acute inflammation. IL-8, C5A, Lutetriene B4 is gonna be chemotactic, particularly for neutrophils. Okay, check out first aid. They have it uh, nicely outlined for you guys. Vasodilation, uh, bradykinin, also histamine is used in that. Bradykinin also brings the pain. Uh, and then again, activated tissue macrophages, IL-1, IL-6, tumor necrosis factor alpha. What is that telling you? These macrophages are telling you you have an active infection that you need to deal with. All right, now chronic inflammation, time has gone on. Um, what you need to worry about is interferon gamma. Dr. Ramos loves interferon gamma, know everything about it. And tumor necrosis factor alpha will still be there. So interestingly enough, tumor necrosis factor alpha kind of just tell you there's, there's an infection. Not only is it there in the acute phase, it's still there in the chronic phase. But if they ask you something specifically to chronic inflammation, interferon gamma, is going to be a um, big player there, right? Granulomas, would you consider granuloma chronic infection? Yeah, because you didn't really kill the bacteria, you just walled it off. Interferon gamma is common in granulomas, granulomatous diseases, okay? Chronic inflammation. All right, interferon alpha. So the idea, primarily when you think of interferons, at least alpha and beta, you're thinking of viral infections. They kind of want to prevent this, um, this, this transition to neighboring cells, right? So if these interferons can be released, you can help to isolate or, uh, yeah, let's say isolate the, um, the virus to a specific cell. So you can't get this transferred from the, to the vir from, of the virus from one cell to the other, okay? So think of that as viral. And then big star, interferon gamma, major player in chronic inflammation, but it has a lot of, um, different properties, y'all will get a, a question or maybe more than one. Um, and remember, macrophages deal with granulomas. This is good. I'm bringing this up because it's term, the rest of term three and term four, big deal. Macrophages deal with granulomas. If we are talking granulomas, we're talking chronic infection, interferon gamma, chronic infection, okay? Everything works together. I mean, here we go, it's right, interferon gamma, granuloma formation. Again, macrophage, here's macrophages. Yeah. Now, another thing uh, to note, these macrophages also um, 
secrete IL-1 and IL-12. Put those together with macrophages, put those together with granuloma formation, keep those together with interferon gamma, okay? I know it's a lot, but um, it's doable. You'll be fine. <laughs> Until this part where we talk about this nonsense, okay. Um, so there's different pathways. The classic pathway is the adaptive pathway. Uh, the alternative and the mannose binding lectin pathway is uh, more of the innate immunity. You don't need to get bogged down with this, okay? The whole point is to get to a place where we can make C3 convertase, which they all do. Um, the alternative just goes through C3. The classic goes through C, and the uh, mannose binding lectin goes through C1 to get to C3. And then eventually you make the MAC complex, right? The C9, C6 through C9 is gonna make a pore, right? They combine to make a pore, you put it in the cell, you have a you can have osmotic um, lysis, right? Once you make a pore in the pore in the cell, break the membrane. Don't get bogged down with this. I'm going to show you what y'all need to know in a second, um, right? Like I don't know that it's necessary to like whiteboard all this out. You just need to know the deficiencies that correlate with these. So one thing to know again, classical pathway is adaptive. Okay, the other two could fall under the innate. Whole goal make C3 convertase, right? Again, you make C3B. Why is that important? That's our major opsonizer, okay? Then you see this poor, this poor formation, C6 through C9. Alternative pathway, again, um, I'll, I'll propertin pro, pro pro um, is an important, maybe a keyword, just in case it's in the stem, but this is part of the innate immunity Mannose binding lectin, you actually have these little lex, uh, lectin molecules that bind, okay? They're kind of isolated. And again, this is innate immunity. But what you read, oh, one more thing, MAC complex, reminds me of that song, I don't know, Return of the MAC, I don't know. I have to hear it every time I think of the MAC complex, so now y'all do too. So, um, so yeah, C6 through C9, gonna make this poor Return of the MAC. There you go, attack complex. So definitely know which ones correlate six through nine or C3, C5B through nine. Um, star on this slide, know what goes with what. MAC complex, right? C6 through nine or C5B through nine. Our major opsonizers, C3B. Inflammation, C3A and C5A. Uh, clearance, also opsonized, right? C3B. And then viral neutralization, not as, as important. But yeah, you get it. And this is just another explanation, but you can kind of see how they go together. It reminds me of the, um, what do you call it? The, the clotting cascade, right? They have their different branch points, but they come together to the centralized thing. But again, you don't really need to focus on this. What you need to focus on here are the, um, the deficiencies. So if you have a classical pathway or the adaptive pathway deficiency, you can get things like lupus, uh, uh, glom glomerul glomerul glomerulonephritis, glomerulonephritis, sorry, that's the kidney problem um, in the glomerulus and vasculitis. You'll get into these later. Uh, there's a bunch of different ones that you have to know. Um, so just know what goes with what. So classic pathway can lead to this, these, sort, these sorts of diseases. <clears throat> the mannose binding less, la, um, lectin pathway Re resorts in pyogenic infections. What are pyogenic infections? Bacterial, right? What fights off those? Uh, neutrophils. What does it form? Pus. Purulent exudate. Okay, so those all go together. Um, uh, yeah, propertin. Remember that has to do with um, what do we say? Oh, you the alt. Wait. Oh, the alternative pathway. Yes. Okay, so. You are prone to Neisseria infections. Make sure you know that. Encapsulated organs. Why is that? Well, C3B is required for opsonization. If you can't, uh, these encapsulated or, uh, or organisms um, are very difficult to kill. If you can't opsonize it, it's hard to tell the body to kill it. Just a quick way I remember of, of knowing these is shin. I put this in the chat earlier. So strep. H influenza, influenza and Neisseria. 
how do I spell that? There, yeah, close enough. Um, these are all encapsulated. Okay, so if you don't have C3B, you can't opsonize it. Right? So if you can't do that, you can't do this, you can't do that, you're prone to these. Okay, so remember Shin, staph, I'm sorry, just so not staph, strep, hemophilus influ influenza, and Neisseria. Those are the big ones. Um, and you see that with patients like um, sickle cell disease. Um, they often get asplenectomy. Um, so they're uh, prone to that as well. All right. And then when we talk about the MAG deficiencies, again, Neisseria. Neisseria is a problem. What kind of symptoms would you expect? Fever, even meningitis. Remember stiff neck. If they ever talk about that, that's always meningitis. Okay, so MAC deficiency. So again, don't get bogged down. It is complicated, these different pathways. Just focus on if you have a deficiency in one of the pathways, what would what sort of infection or deficiency? What's so if you have a deficiency, what sort of infections would that lead to? Okay. Um, big one. I have a slide coming up, but the C1 inhibitor pathway, if you can't inhibit C1, you're going you're gonna to cause um, all this inflammation and you get this hereditary angioedema, okay? Um, also important, decay accelerating factor, uh, you get paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria, so they, it, the patients end up waking up with blood in their urine, happens at night. Um, you don't need to know why right now, but just because of their ventilation slows down, they get metabolic acidosis. Um, so yeah, um, <clears throat> so yeah, that's important for that. So remember DAF correlates to CD55 and 59, okay? And then here's that hereditary angioedema. Um, what you see is this inflammatory process. So you don't have C1 inhibitor. You can't slow down this inflammation. You get a lot of bradykinin. You get, um, not, uh, not histamine, but you get bradykinin. So you get um, this increased swelling, this vasodilation, this vascular permeability, what you don't see is the rash. Urticaria is a rash. If this was, if you were to try to differentiate this from some sort of, um, some sort of uh, anaphylaxis or allergic reaction, if it was anaphylaxis, you would get histamine release and you would expect to see a rash, okay? So that's the whole point. What they'll probably ask you about is this. If you have someone with this C1 inhibitor deficiency, if you look at the pathway, they end up getting a reduced C4. Anybody with a reduced C4, uh, you should consider hereditary angioedema, okay? I'm pretty sure that's what they asked us about, the lab values. And this is a nice little uh, diagram kind of explaining what goes with what. We got a star, you know it for sure. All right, um, why did I put this one here? Uh, I guess just, yeah, kind of just ex explains everything, what goes with what, if you want a little more explanation. Now, um, in circulation, B cells can, uh, um, well, not necessarily, usually not in circulation. We're talking about in lymph nodes, you get this, um, B cells can bind antigens. Um, so that's a normal process, but these T cells will not necessarily bind antigens. They have on their own, they have to have antigen presentation, right? These APC cells. And um, right, so that's what this says here. So this antigen has to actually present it to this T cells, whereas the B cells can grab onto it sometimes in circulation. So T cells always are gonna require um, this MHC presentation from the antigen presenting cell. So again, a lot of this is complex, but her questions were pretty straightforward. Like they were just asking basic definition type stuff. Okay, and so again, remember those dendritic cells float around, there's your surveillance, they're your hall monitors, they grab onto the antigens and they're gonna present it to the T cells. All right, we talked about this already. Remember class one is gonna have three alpha chains and a beta two microglobulin. And then, um, yeah, and this kind of says here, remember MHC1, it's gonna bind CD8, okay? You're gonna deal primarily with viruses, intracellular stuff. Remember CD8 is gonna be our, our Navy SEAL. Go into the cell, drop gray enzymes, get out, cell blows up. Um, and then in uh, class two, uh, two alpha, two beta, it traverses the, the membrane two different places, right? 
Um, and remember these MHC2s are gonna only be on the antigen presenting cells. MHC1s will be on all nucleated cells. So remember that, keep those in mind. Um, good differentiator. And right, we talked about this already, right? CD8s go with MHC class one. CD4s go with class two. Um, and these APCs are gonna be deal with the, the class two, whereas all nucleated cells are class one. Now, this was an aggravating thing to try to work out, but this was the last slide in the lectures and I think it sums up everything well. It kind of paints a picture for you guys. Remember, if you keep everything organized, um, you can walk through the process. This process isn't super important. It's just important to know what goes with what. Okay, so remember CD4 cells, they're gonna have antigen presentation. They're gonna be primarily deal, dealing with extracellular stuff. If it's extracellular, you have to take it in. You have to endocytosis. So you take this extracellular antigen, you endocytosis, okay? It's confusing endocytic, endocytic and endogenous. It's not the same thing. Exogenous means it comes from an, an outside source, an exogenous source. Endogenous means you're dealing with it on the inside. To get an exogenous source, you have the endocytosis, right? Right, pull it in, right? And then you get this uh, right here, this invariable chain kind of hides the, the pocket for the binding cell Then this clip binds. It goes up here, once the clip's removed, uh, the antigen could bind and uh, then you can form um, proper, you can then present um, or, or the, the T cell can develop further to, to make memory against it, okay? So just know what goes with what. So this side, remember CD8 cells, um, they're going to, um, um, the, the, they have the, the MHC class one, all nucleated cells and abide C, uh, CD8 cells. Now, the, remember the CD8 cells, like our Navy SEALs, are going to deal with uh, intracellular stuff. So all this is intracellular, cytosolic, right? Cytosol is intracellular, endogenous, intracellular. So this is where we use our TAP protein, and you develop the antigen. So the virus is already inside the cell. It's endogenous. You break it through the proteasome. You go through the TAP. You're in the ER, and then you're able to then kick it out and present it, MHC class one, okay, to the CD8 cell. So you would consider this, a new, any nucleated cell could handle this, any um, antigen presenting cell would go through this process. So just keep them separate and you should be fine. Now, there are a few things to point out. One, some viruses don't, some viruses uh, cross over. So this is one of those weird exceptions. Um, some of these inactive viruses will go through the exogenous pathway. Now, let me go back. You would expect, since viruses are endogenous, you would expect it to be um, processed this way. Some of these viruses will actually go through this process. It's one of those things, everything's not exactly black and white. So just keep that in mind. I don't know that they'll ask y'all about that, but um, depending on the virus, um, it may go one way or the other. Now, there are two things that can interfere with this process. Uh, HSV, now straightforward definitions, just know what they do. HSV, uh, herpes simplex virus, will block the TAP protein. So you can't, uh, you can't um, present the antigen properly. So this is through that uh, any nucleated cell, MHC1, CD8 process. So HSV can block the TAP. Um, adenovirus can also prevent um, the antigen from getting to the surface. So make sure you know these, these are, these are both deal with that endogenous pathway. Makes sense because they're viruses, they should be on the inside. Okay, general summary, read through it. Um, yeah, just try to, don't, don't get the words mixed up. Hey Brady, I just had a quick question. Yeah. Um, she had a slide that said the endocytic pathway or the exogenous pathway is lysosomal versus the cytosolic being non-lysosomal and that confuses me sometimes. Like yeah. why is that the case? <laughs> yeah, you could you could think of this endosome as sort of like a lysosome. Like you can see how the structure is built here. You have to break it down into its fair fair products, right? 
So if you think of that as a lysosome, this, endoso this endosomal body coming through and then you lyse it down to get to your product so you could form antigens from it. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay, thank you. No problem. Um, okay, antibodies, right. So you don't need to get bogged down with this. You could do a whole term uh, on, on you know, these, this, this processing, uh, you know, these antigenic processing. But the point is that these B cells need to make these antibodies so that they can identify antigens. So in this light blue region, you see your constant region. So what happens if you have a cell and you have a constant region, your constant region is going to be inside the cell. Constant region doesn't bind anything, okay? Your variable region is what's gonna bind stuff, okay? That's terrible, but okay. That's what's gonna bind stuff. The constant part is constantly inside the cell. It's standardized, right? It just fits in the cell. You need the variable region to be different. It needs to look like the antigen, all right? So if they, like we said, the virus is a car. If the, if the antigen is the tire, right? A part of the car, this pocket needs to fit the tire, okay? So when that antigen comes in, this variable region the variability makes it specific to this, this antigen coming through so it could bond, okay? From that point, you can mount a response to it. Okay, so again, it's very complicated when you talk about how these actually form, but just remember the constant region is not gonna change, okay? This variable region is what's gonna actually bind the antigen. You can see right here. Then you have light chains and heavy chains. Again, you don't need to get too bogged down with this stuff. Um, now, yeah, so uh, just definition stake, you can have this constant region, which is the carboxy end, right? You remember when we talk about amino acids, you, you, you have the amino end and the carboxy end. The carboxy end is going to be the constant region that binds to the cell, and the part that sticks out, the variable region, will be um, um, the, the amino end, right? So the variability. And you could see this heavy chain and light chain. They just come together. Um, to allow this binding pocket right here. Now, um, this AB, uh, so, so remember the FAB is the part of the antibody that actually binds to the antigen. The C is goes into the cell. Constant domain goes into the cell. Antibody is actually gonna bind to this antigen, okay? On the amino end. And then, yeah, you can see how it kind of goes into the cell here. Remember when you're talking about these, um, I think I have a better slide. Yeah, so the heavy chain is gonna determine what actually, what the cell actually is, right? Um, so remember the, um, the initial response is you're gonna make IgM, uh, then you're gonna class switch and make IgG to have that long-term response. Uh, we don't really talk about um, uh, IgD. IgE is uh, primarily allergic reaction, has, yeah. Um, and then IgA is gonna be mucosal, right? So the mucosal lining, IgA crosses in breast milk, IgG crosses the placenta. So these are just little things that are good to know, but I think there's a slide coming up. Uh, this is just from first aid. You can kind of see uh, what they like to say about it. They have uh, fragment antigen binding, right? So that's the part that binds the constant region, carboxy terminal. So these are just uh, basic definitions for um, what regions do what. I put this in here just in case y'all get a question um, they could ask you. I'm pretty sure they asked this one of these. Maybe it was a practice question, but just know what correlates with what. Idiotype will be like the binding pockets. Isotype primarily is the constant region. All right, and you can see here, yeah, okay. So yeah, IgG is going to be uh, your long-acting long cells. Plasma cells are going to be pumping those out. IgAs will be in your mucus, right, so in the linings. A mucus and serous secretion. IgM will be your first line defense, the first ones made. Remember IgM class switching to IgG is that important process for long-term immunity. And then IgE, um, I think of E kind of like eosinophils, even though that's not the same, but like E deals with allergies and parasites and so does eosinophils. So um, a good point to be made here, this J chain, the J stands for joining. Um, two of these antibody uh, 
uh, make complexes through the J chain. So IgA makes dimers through the J chain and IgM makes uh, pentamers through the J chain. They bind, it's just, that's just what they do. So you could get a question about that, but by making these, this, this pentamer, it's just more, more uh, availability to bind in the antigens in circulation, all right? Um, like I, I, made, I showed you all my condensed notes earlier, go look at that. I, I wrote down like what, what's present in each of these. Cause you could get a question like where the rag one and rag two stuff is and like all that nonsense. Um, but straightforward, it's just, unfortunately it's one of those things you just have to memorize. But I wrote them out in my condensed notes. So y'all are welcome to go look at that. All right, all right. Another disease, um, this X-linked A gamma globulinemia. Um, the point is, um, if you do not have this BTK, you can't properly develop this B cell, this B cell lineage. I'm sorry, you can't properly make antibodies from the B cell lineage, all right? So you're gonna get normal pre-B cell populations, but going from pre to immature and then to the mature B cell, you won't get um, uh, any uh, immunoglobulins. So if y'all remember that thing where we had like the acute phase, we had like albumin, and then like alpha one, alpha two and beta. And then like there was supposed to be like this gamma, this gamma chain. Well, that was weird. Um, in Bruton's A gamma globulinemia, you won't get any gamma chains because you can't properly make these um, immunoglobulins, right? So A gamma globulinemia means you don't have immunoglobulins. So you're at risk for a whole lot of infections, right? if you don't make those, any sort of long-term long immunity with antibodies is kind of shot at scale. So just make sure if they talk about a person, I doubt they'll give you the, the albumin thing, but it may come in later um, just because that's how they actually test to see if you have immunoglobulins. All right, now let's do this. All right, so now in the thymus, you have a T cell. And originally it's actually gonna have a CD4 and a CD8 on it. You have to go through two processes in the thymus to determine if the cell is good enough to go out in circulation and try to find other, uh, uh, find any antigens or viruses or bacteria. So the first process is gonna be positive selection. Now, this process is just gonna say, is the T cell we made good enough to bind anything, right? It's okay if it binds your self antigens, but is it, you know, because you have to remember this process is very randomized. So they're gonna make this random T cell with this random, uh, you know, complexes on it. And you're gonna have to say, can this actually, is this a viable, a uh, cell to bind uh, um, molecules or antigens, right? Are they in circulation? So you go through positive selection and if they say they sell, yes, this can actually bind. It could bind self, it could bind uh, antigens in circulation. From this point, it's either delineated as a CD4 or a CD8 cell. So let's call it a CD4. Now, the most important point here is that it actually has to go through this negative selection process. So the worst thing is you don't want to put out you, selection. Sorry. Um, you don't want to put out cells that are going to bind you like yourself. So by negatively selecting, it's going to check to see if this if this cell is going to bind self. So if it does not, no binding to self antigens, right? So red blood cells or whatever, antigen. At this point, you could say, okay, we'll send this cell out into circulation. It's good enough to go. Okay, now we're, we're gonna talk about, um, we're gonna talk about some of the players that come into this process uh, uh, in a second, but that's just kind of the general idea. So you wanna positively select it to say, okay, this is this is a viable cell. We can actually put it out. It's it's sustainable. Then you have to go through negatively so negative selection 
to make sure it's not going to bind your own your own cells, right? You just want to bind, bind uh, foreign cells. All right, so that's that process. Now, again, my condensed notes, I put these definitions in there. This is probably what they'll ask. Um, just straightforward, when you go through the negative selection process of recognizing self, air drives this process, okay? A-I-R-E, this regulator. It makes sense, right? This helps to prevent autoimmune uh, responses. You don't want to fight yourself, right? So you don't want any sort of autoimmune problems. So air will drive that process. And this kind of just shows you how it actually goes through the positive selection. Can it bind antigen presenting cells? Okay, cool. So positive, we'll use it, but let's check and make sure it doesn't bind self, go through negative selection. If it does, you kill it. If not, it's good to go. Okay. Then this is just a good summary here. Uh, of like everything, uh, don't get bogged down if you haven't seen some of these 21, 22, but um, just know um, kind of what goes with what. Okay, again, from first aid, this is the process of activation and class switching. Did y'all talk about hyper IgM syndrome? Do y'all know? Not yet. Okay, I wanna talk about it just because it makes a good example. Um, class switching, primarily we go from IgM to IgG. So this process, uh, uh, the point I wanna make is aid. aid. Aid will aid the process of class switching. Remember we said that heavy chain is, is what's gonna determine what we are, if we're M or G or whatever. So aid is gonna help in this class switching. There is a syndrome you will talk about called hyper IgM where you get increased IgM. Why is that? Well, that the problem is you can't properly class switch. So you get a ton of IgM, but you can't switch to IgG. So you get no long-term immunity. So the point being is that Aid is a big player in this class switching process. And in order to make these IgGs, this long-term immunity, um, class switching is gonna be uh, necessary. So this kind of talks about it there. Uh, after the midterm, y'all will get into CD40 and CD40 ligand and all that. And that's when y'all will talk about it, but it makes the point, right? If you can't class switch, that's the issue. The last lecture, I'm pretty sure we didn't have any questions on it. Um, this is very complicated, but the whole point is that um, you have, uh, I, I don't know how many, it's like 50 or, or 500 different uh, um, genes or something like that. And But by combining them in different orders, you can have millions of different combinations. So the thing is the B cells will take the antigen, take it in and make antibodies to that antigen. The T cell just makes everything. So if the antigen, let's say is a lock, right? And you need to make an antibody for that lock, the T cell doesn't know what the lock looks like. So it makes millions of keys and floats them around just in case it'll fit the lock. It's kind of crazy. Whereas the B cell could kind of make a mold of it. If, it. if it catches it in circulation, it can make a mold of the lock and try to make the antibody to it. But the point is, the T cell is gonna make millions of different keys to try to, just in case it comes across something that it recognizes as non-self. So these VDJ recombination, this process is making a million different teeth on the key so that if it comes across that antigen lock, it can address it, okay? <clears throat> That's the best way I can explain it. Um, this is important because you need to know uh, and this is what I illustrated in, in my condensed notes, but you need to know what is expressed where. So they could ask you where the RAG1 and RAG2 are expressed, your pro to pre, even through immature cells, but then it goes away. CD19 um, comes through. Uh, you'll originally see CD19 as a pro B cell, and then CD20 joins in as a pre. So we did have questions on this. You need to know um, you know, what uh, surface proteins and what um, gene expression correlates to what. And also um, you don't see surface um, antibodies on these B cells until it's an immature, okay? The pre B cells aren't gonna have any antibodies on the surface. And then matures are gonna have Ds as well. And then it could go out into circulation. So just know what goes with what. Like I said, again, I illustrated it in my condensed notes if you don't wanna write it out yourself. 
Now, this is what I was saying. I don't know how many, I think, I forget if it was 50, I think it was like 500 different segments. But if you combine those in different variations, you get millions and millions of different keys, right? Different teeth on the keys. Just in case you come across it, you can address it, okay? So it's a crazy process, but that's kind of how it goes. So this is this hypermutation process. So once you actually get um, the uh, something sim that could almost fit the key or almost fit the lock, you can you can um, you can hypermutate it. And again, aid is going to aid in this hypermutation process. Um, did I have? Okay, uh, I think I had another. Okay, yeah, there. Okay. Let's make sure it's there. Um, so aid is gonna help in this hyper mutation process. So what you're trying to do through this, you, you're trying to fine tune the antibody to make sure it fits as tightly as possible, okay, to the antigen in circulation. So as it says here, you will talk about this CD4040L later on, but uh, the point I wanted to make is aid. Aid will help with class switching and aid will help with somatic hypermutation. Definition, know it. What does AIR do? AIR helps with negative, uh, negative selection. AID helps with class switching and somatic hypermutation. I mentioned hyper-M syndrome. It's an issue class switching. Uh, yeah, you can do that. All right, any questions? Okay, cool. Okay, so I tried to condense this down as much as possible. There are some very high yield topics in here that you do need to spend some time on, but I tried to focus on those so that you can maximize the 48 plus hours you have, no, not even 48, before your exam. So um, this first population health lecture, a lot of it was intro. The biggest things that I noted that I wanted to um, remember for the exam, this is one of them factors that affect health because at different levels, you can intervene in different ways. And so if you intervene, so for example, counseling and education, um, you can increase management, increase disease condition management, um, but you also increase individual effort needed. So it's really just giving a breakdown of different um, places in the population that you can take effect. So this is what, um, this is one of those things I focused on for that. And then why address roles of social determinants? Um, um, because we are trying to achieve health equity because health isn't just, you know, biology. There's a lot of stuff that uh, it's multifactorial and it's not always in our control and a lot of it does have to do with socioeconomic status and stuff like that so um this is a big big thing in healthcare nowadays is to make sure that we are accounting for all of that to treat patients well okay getting into the errors um medical errors this is something, uh, it's a wrong action versus an omission that is an inaction. And so no um, errors of commission, action, omission, inaction. Um, an error ends when the patient actually receives the medication. So there are a lot of steps up to that. And then if they're given the medication, then things can happen. So you have a potential adverse um, drug event. So um, it's intercepted before it reaches the patient, a preventable one. Um, it reaches the patient and causes harm and then non-preventable. This is basically an unknown allergy or an undisclosed allergy. There's not a whole lot you can do if the patient doesn't talk to you or if they don't know their history. So that's non-preventable. So what we want to um, what we want to really focus on are these preventable preventable ones that um, are ripe with human error. Um, so causes patient specific, um, elderly taking multiple meds, um, may be vulnerable because they forget how much they take, or they forget that they took it and they took, take it again, drug specific, um, 
And then clinician specific, we'll talk a lot about these and strategies for reducing medical errors. They did focus a lot on the reduction of a lot of these things. And I put all of them in here to kind of train your eye to them. Okay, I really do need to look at this, um, but make sure that you are aware of different ways to avoid these things. So transcription training, the five R's with so the right drug, right patient, right dose, right route, right time, and then computerized physician order entry. This is a system that will do it all for you. And so if, as long as it's documented, um, you can avoid a lot of adverse reactions. Um, if you put it into this, what are you? No, we don't hang out on the windowsill. Sorry. Okay. Iatrogenic hospital acquired, um, know this definition. And then of course, how to reduce it. And so, I mean, UTIs, this is a huge one, central line associated, that's a big one. Um, this is just the definition. The big thing is how you're going to reduce um, these at the institution level. You know, they can increase the availability and access to um, sanitizing agents. Um, you can wash hands. This is, I, I'm pretty sure they harped on this one, the washing hands with soap and water, um, because that in itself can reduce a lot of transmission. And so focus on these, focus on what can be done to prevent. Again, they like preventative measures and say, and they say, okay, this happened. How can you prevent it in the future or something like that? So, um, focus on that. Patient falls, this is another one where they like to say, okay, what are the risk factors and how can you prevent it? And so risk factors, of course, advanced age, multiple meds, um, because you can have sedatives, hypnotics, things that give you an altered level of consciousness, impaired memory, difficulty walking, basically anything that is going to um, cause a less than optimal state of mind. And then how do you um, prevent this? You can identify them with armbands, so which means any person working in the hospital or facility knows that this person needs to have a little more care. And then um, Education is a big thing, you know, talking with patients and families is a huge avenue to um, prevent a lot of bad things from happening. So again, focus on how to reduce the risk and how to combat all of those things. And then just, of course, other adverse um, outcomes, unplanned readmissions. Um, so this can happen for a lot of reasons, premature discharge, discharge to inappropriate settings. So you want to make sure that if you're discharging a patient, you're doing so at the right time that they are able to take care of themselves, or if they aren't able to take care of themselves, they're going to a place that will take care of them. And then anesthesia, unsafe blood products, those are just other adverse patient outcomes. Now, there are a lot of slides on this. I broke this down. This is pretty high yield. Um, you'll have a couple, a few questions on this. The biggest thing is to focus in on the big idea of these. And that's what I try to do on this slide. So a no fault error, it's outside of your control. There's really nothing you could have done to prevent it. It just happened. Systems related, this is due to technical or, or organizational flaws. So this is kind of policies and procedures in place that don't benefit the patient. And so you're doing your job. Um, in, you know, a hospital system um, is inadequate and something happens to the patient because of that. So that system is related. And then you have cognitive, which is at the level of the physician. So these are diagnoses that are wrong, missed or delayed. And this is on you essentially. So an anchoring bias, this is basically you have, you get an initial present presentation and you don't adapt to it. So they may, someone may come in, it's a young female who has nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain. Um, your first thought may be, oh, maybe pregnancy or something like that. And you miss other symptoms along the way because you aren't willing to adapt to the patient story and you dismiss other signs and symptoms because it's like, okay, this is my initial impression. This is what we're going with. You're anchored to that initial impression. That's what an anchoring bias is. A confirmation bias is a preconceived notion of the patient. And so you go in there, you kind of have an idea, and then you're kind of looking for things in the patient history to confirm what you think is going on. So it's not that you aren't adapting to the story. You're listening to the story, but you're trying to pick and choose. Okay. This supports what I think this supports what I think and everything else doesn't. So whatever. Nope. We don't get on the table. 
Um, availability, this is simply ease of recall. So you think of something, uh, you, you hear symptoms, something comes to your mind, and then it's like, okay, that must be it. And so you don't really look past that because it's like, oh, this is what I thought of. This is what I'm going to go. This is the road I'm going to go down. Um, diagnosis momentum. So it's passed from one doc to the other kind of without question. Um, so it's like, oh, hey, yeah, I had this patient with this and oh, I had this patient with this. And so you just keep building that momentum. And so you don't really look in other avenues. Framing effect, this is a bias because of collateral or extraneous patient info. So um, this is a common thing that I saw when I was working in the ED. A patient comes in, history of alcohol abuse, presents with abdominal pain, um, you know, or I'm not saying it's happened. I'm saying this is something docs always used to say. You can't always just take the patient as their situation. You have to look further because this alcohol abuse patient, you may be thinking, oh, the history of alcohol abuse. Okay. And you have form a bias and you treat based on that bias. It's like, okay, they're, they're in withdrawal, but that might not be the actual case. So the framing effect is, is just, you have a biased um, you are biased against the patient in some way due to an extraneous factor, it's just by simply them walking in the room. You're like, okay, you are an IV drug user. So it's probably this, that's kind of a thing. And then premature closure. Um, this is stop looking before all info is in. So this is kind of a culmination or, um, incorporation of a lot of these. And so it's basically, you, you just don't pursue as hard or as much as you should, and you just stop looking. Um, so all of these are cognitive, cognitive errors at the level of the physician. This is pretty high yield. Make sure you can differentiate between all of them. Medical error um, treatment, so failure to correctly administer treatment or perform a procedure. Um, they like to do the combination of slipped lapse mistake and then um, like near miss, that kind of thing. So that's also very high yield. Make sure you understand that. So the basically it comes down to intent. A slip is an unintended, unplanned event. So you don't mean to do it. It's a complete accident and it just happens. A lapse is a missed action or omission. So you're forgetting something. And then a mistake is an intended action. So you actually did intend to do something and this intention is incorrect and it is a mistake. So make sure you can differentiate between these slips and laps. That's going to be big to, um, differentiate because a mistake is a wrong intended action, whereas a, a mistake isn't a wrong intended where a slip and lapse, it's not really intended, it just happens. So make sure you can differentiate between those. Violation, you know it goes against it and you do it anyway, and that is not good at all. It is not an error. And this opens you up for um, a lot of bad things that you will learn about in the final exam. Um, outcomes, again, they like to combine these with um, the medical errors. So a near miss, it's caught in time. The medication doesn't actually get to the patient. The intervention is not performed on the patient. Um, um, adverse effect, it's given to the patient and they do have an adverse effect. The difference is, of course, sentinel event. This is serious harm. Um, so death or serious harm has, has occurred. And so make sure you can differentiate between these three and then the, um, near event, serious reportable events. Um, of course that list, this, these are things that should never, ever, ever happen. And if they do, um, not good for your patient. Human factors that contribute to unsafe care. Again, they like to focus on what can be done to prevent or mitigate these things. So communication, teamwork, errors at time of transition to handoff. This is a big, 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 big one. Transition and handoff is when most errors occur due to lack of communication or something. So I would highlight that, understand that. 
stress and fatigue, potential harm, amplified by poor working conditions. So this is along the lines of the institutional thing. So um, the I'm safe thing. So if you are, if you have an illness, you're on medication, you have increased stress, you've consumed alcohol, fatigue, eating, like, can you safely treat a patient? So it's like, I'm safe. This is you asking yourself this question is, am I in the right um, mind capacity to treat this patient? So that's something you can do for yourself. Um, Burnout and fatigue, they will ask about this. The difference between these two is fatigue is it, it's an inability or unwillingness. So this is a decision almost. Like I'm fatigued, I'm tired, I'm unwilling to do something. Whereas burnout is a state of mind. It's a depersonalization. It's something a lot deeper. And I mean, all of us know this. This is something a lot deeper than just fatigue and you don't want to do something. Burnout is when you're just emotionally exhausted and um, it affects your um, mental state right there. So do understand the difference between these two because they will ask about it. Again, what can you do to mitigate these things? We like to harp on that. I know I've said that a million times, but a lot of questions will come from here. Um, so communication, teamwork strategies, the situation background assessment recommendation. So you want to make sure you are asking the right questions so that you can catch um, mistakes or slips. And then good communication, teamwork strategies. Again, call out, read back, critical language, know what each of these are. Um, call out, you know, you're informing team members during an event. So this happens during most big procedures and then all surgery. So you're going to call out, you call out the patient's name, the procedure, you know, if it's um, an arm or a leg, you know, which arm, which leg. And so you're calling out. So every single person in the room um, knows what's going on. You're on the same page, but then you can also correct that person if something's wrong. Um, read back. You repeat a message, this makes sure you're on the same page. Then critical language, you um, need to make sure that you can communicate if something is wrong. I've heard so many horror stories in hospitals and in ORs about um, people not communicating and things going wrong. So um, again, know how to mitigate these things. Errors, they are going to happen. It's just, it's, inevitable. So what happens when they do happen? Reporting errors. So the biggest thing is to mitigate future errors. So it's not, it's not always a shame on you kind of thing. It's okay. How do we fix this so it doesn't happen in the future? Um, so you can redesign the system. Um, this is a big theme they like to harp on. This is more conceptual than anything. We're not focusing on the individual. You're focusing on how to, um, on what led to it happening and how to prevent it from happening in the future. What is reported, near misses are not disclosed to patients or families because if nothing happens, then there's no real reason to um, tell the family. However, it does need to be reported. Anything needs to be reported. And again, it's not necessarily to get somebody in trouble. It's to assess the system and make sure that it doesn't happen again in the future. So it's not it's not a penalty kind of thing. It's we are continually reevaluating our system and making sure that we are always moving forward and progressing forward towards safety. What does need to be disclosed to the patient and family adverse and sentinel events? That's kind of self-explanatory, um, but just know that you do not have to report near misses to the family, to, to the patient or family. Um, how, sh how should it be done? Um, need to be openly discussed to the affected patient in certain circumstances, again, adverse and sentinel effects, um, and then what is needed and what to do. Now, going to the system. So all of this is high yield. The biggest thing, they're, they aren't going to try to trick you with this, but you do need to understand the purpose of each of these so you can answer these questions. So the Swiss cheese model, basically it's saying that you are lining up different layers of protection in the hopes that each layer, if it does have a hole, the holes aren't going to line up and cause downstream effects. So 
that's the biggest thing with the Swiss cheese model. model. You want to make sure that each layer of protection is going to catch anything that the other layer let slip through the cracks. And then hopefully that is enough so that the patient isn't harmed. But sometimes it happens. Um, and then of course you have to evaluate. So systems thinking analysis, do associate this with the Swiss cheese model. So you redesign a system not to remove uh, the possibility of error, but to create and reinforce barriers to harm. So here we're not necessarily fixing the actual possibility of error. We just wanna make sure that those error, those holes don't line up so that something happens down the line. We talked about this, the computer physician order entry system. This is something that can be put into place so that you can catch a lot of those things. There are so many times when a physician will enter something in there and the computer will say back, oh, no, adverse effect, adverse effect, or this patient is um, allergic and they didn't tell you they were allergic, um, but they told someone else in the past. And so that is a huge thing in um, catching some of these things. Now, moving on to root cause analysis, remember all of these high yield, you need to understand if they give you a long vignette and they say, how could, um, how, what test could you um, use to figure out, you know, A, B, C, D. So root cause is, um, retrospective. So you, you, so you're identifying causative factors underlying variations in performance. So, okay, this happened. Okay. Let's go back and let's see what led to this happening. So it's retrospective. You're asking what, how, why. So you're using records and you're using interviews to identify those points in the process that led to that outcome. So you identify and describe the problem. You establish a timeline um, for the normal situation up to the problem. You distinguish the root cause, causal factors, and then you make a causal graph. So we look at the fishbone diagram. So it's basically, you're looking back in time, retroactive, you're trying to identify, okay, where are kind of the leaks in this boat? Where are the holes? And um, so that we can move forward. So that's root cause analysis. So what is the cause of what happened? Failure mode and um, effects analysis, this is proactive. So um, RCA was retroactive, RR, corny, but it works. Failure mode and effects, um, proactive. So you're planning, you're preparing, and you're preventing something from happening. So this isn't necessarily some, um, it's like something happened, you are looking at a situation and you're trying to predict what could happen and then prepare for the future. So continual process of quality improvement. So what might grow wrong with this? What's the impact of such failure? So they use this risk priority number. So severity, um, probability of occurrence, and then probability of detection. Um, I really put this on here for completion sake, but just... Um, understand that this is a tool to use to assess certain situations. And this is to plan and prepare um, for something that could happen. Um, human factors and design, um, put this in here for completion's sake. Um, forcing function prevents the user from taking action without, okay, you, can, you guys can read that. Plan to do, study act cycle this in the next one um you'll differentiate so this is something you can quickly implement on a small scale it's a continual improvement process the example they use is the no show rate so a physician's office that has a high rate of no shows that pa patients aren't coming in for their appointments so it's like okay let's define the problem let's do a new process measure the effectiveness and then, you know, integrate it into regular workflow. So it's basically you're identifying a small scale problem that you can, you know, assess and change quickly. And you're doing something to um, improve that process versus this one. This is a large scale transformation. The six is it six Sigma model. This is data. I'll fix that for you guys data driven large scale transformation. So defining the problem, measure effects. So this is essentially like these processes are very similar to the plan, do, act, study cycle, but understand that 
the PDSA is small scale, quick, continual improvement versus Six Sigma, which is a large scale transformation. It's data driven and it's, um, it's kind of a more big picture thing. Hazard and risk, do know the difference between these two, you will get a question. So a hazard is a source danger, um, whereas risk is the probability. Um, and so just because, so a hazard results in a risk only if there is exposure. So just because something is hazardous doesn't mean you're at risk. So you can have, you know, a hazard to some substance in your vicinity, but if proper planning and proper protocols are there to keep you safe, it doesn't mean you're at risk of being harmed from that hazard. So that's the difference. It's a very, um, it's a very important distinction and you will be tested on it. So no risk if the hazard is contained. This is, um, um, this is a big thing, you know, occupation, occupational hazards, because, you know, some professions, you do have a lot of hazardous stuff, but doesn't mean you're at risk of being harmed from that um, thing. Um, this was a very uh, long lecture. I took out what I thought you needed to focus on. So this is really high yield. And then um, this is more for completion sake. So environmental determinants of health defined. So breathing second hand smoke is an environmental determinant versus active tobacco smoking is behavioral. So um, you can distinguish between those. This is particulate matter. I don't remember actually being asked a question on this, but you need to understand this concept in case they do. Um, so it, depending on the value of this, you can predict different risks. Um, there was a picture in your notes about the girl who is the first person in history to have um, like pollution or something along those lines listed on their death certificate because it was the cause of her death. Um, so that's that. Classification of biohazards. This is more to um, more for completion's sake, but you do need to understand these. These are different types of hazards that you can have. Um, and then, um, so mode of transmission, direct physical contact, indirect, um, you have vehicles or vectors. Vehicles are inanimate, uh, they're non-biological, and then vectors are, um, okay, never mind. Vehicles, air, water, food, vectors, you have in, um, inanimate and animate. Occupational hazards. Um, they have a few slides on this. The biggest thing they like to focus on, again, prevention, mitigation. You'll have a patient that comes in and they um, have some kind of occupational hazard and they will, the question will ask you, okay, how do you, what would you advise this patient? And usually the answer is elimination, like remove yourself from that environment. And so um, understand, how you would advise your patient in this situation. What should you do? The big, biggest thing is you have to take a full history. You need to ask all the right questions to get to the bottom of the issue so that you can treat it appropriately. So, and so that you can identify that it is an occupational issue because sometimes it might not be, but if it is an occupational issue, then you can advise the patient to remove themselves from that environment. And then, you know, without the injurious thing that their health would improve. Health systems. Um, this actually isn't as complicated as um, you might, as you feel it is, because you look at all this and you're like, it's, oh, it's insurance, oh, payment. Oh, that's so, that's so annoying. It's so complicated. It's not, it really isn't. Um, they're not going to trick you with all of this stuff. Um, so if you know it, you know it basically. Um, so questions that they did on like IMCQs and stuff, I pointed out here. So talking about health coverage, 47% is based off of employment base. 33 is, you know, done by government programs, but healthcare financing, 47% um, is government financing. So knowing those numbers 
um, known as coverage versus financing. So this would be advantageous for you to know in case it shows up on your exam. These are the values that they like. And then insurance, this is actually pretty simple once you get it down. So premium is the basic fees that you pay on a monthly basis. The deductible is out of pocket before um, the insurer pays. Coinsurance is the um, insured person's share. And then copayment is a fixed amount at the time of service. And so they give you this example of the different values. And then, you know, client gets into a vehicular accident. Um, this is the bill. The deductible is this coinsurance is this. So how much are you actually paying out of pocket? Um, and so if the coinsurance is 20% after that, then you're getting that value. If you know how to do these two problems, you're gonna get it right on the exam. You probably, you are going to have um, at least one question, um, but again, it's, it's, they're not gonna to try to trick you. Um, if you know how to do these, you should be able to get it right on the exam. Um, this is just the difference. I don't remember this being too, too high yield, but there is a difference between premium type so you can be experienced so they can give you a premium based off of your age based off of your health or it can just be you know you live in this community so this is the premium you have government finance coverage i remember there being a lot of affordable care act things on the exam so i put wherever applicable i put it in this review so um, comprehensive healthcare law. Um, the three goals you have affordable health insurance for more people, expand Medicaid, and then support innovative medical care. Um, there is no denial of coverage, no remission, and then you have a cap on co payments and out of pocket. Um, some government finance programs, you do need to know these Medicare versus Medicaid. You care for the eight elderly and you aid the poor. Um, so Medicare part A, part B, this, um, actually is pretty, pretty straightforward. These little blurbs that they have like Medicare part A contributory hospital insurance. That's a huge part of what you need to know. So a hospital, there you go. Now there are some caveats to this. You have, you pay into this via social security, as long as you have paid into social security for 10 years. Once you hit 65, you can start receiving Medicare Part A. This also covers your spouse if they are over 65. You can get it under 65 um, uh, if you're on disability, but there's a waiting period. You have to be receiving disability for 24 months. Now, this was a question on the exam. If you, uh, exemptions to the waiting period, if you are under 65 years of age, ALS and then chronic renal disease. So anything requiring, um, dialysis or transplantation and or transplantation. Um, so if you have those conditions, you pretty much automatically qualify for Medicare Part A. Um, so what's covered? Hospitalization, skilled nursing, home skilled healthcare, skilled hospice, not covered, unskilled custodial home care, essentially. B, this is just supplementary, essentially. Um, that's really it. The big thing, C, uh, um, incentives for managed care. D, drugs, this is a big thing. So D, drugs, so that's the big thing here. But with that um, in part, Medicare Part D, there is a donut hole. So, you know, until 2010, if you reach a limit, you then, um, so you have a limit to the care. So once you go over that, you're in this kind of hole and then Affordable Care Act comes along and, um, and then when they reach that donut hole of care, then they are eligible for um, a discount. So that's how the Affordable Care Act um, came in and affected Medicare Part D specifically. Medicaid, this is administered via the federal government and states, but states determine the eligibility. It's basically low income um, and they, um, federal government requires states to cover hospitals, physicians, diagnostics, prenatal, preventative, nursing home, and home care. Affordable Care Act, 
Um, this said that Medicaid eligibility will um, cover all Americans under 65 with incomes below 133% of the federal popular poverty level. That's the important thing here. Um, this is how you qualify for Medicaid. Um, these are the differences. Um, go over that, make sure you can tell the difference. Again, the Medicare stuff, those tiny little blurps, those are going to be buzzwords in the vignette. And then the children's health program, this is coverage for kids and families with incomes at or below 200% of the federal federal poverty level. So that, um, so if you have a vignette with a kid um, and this is the qualifications, like how is this kid going to get coverage? And this is what it is. Then um, these are those two DLAs. I picked out, um, there's a lot in those two DLAs. I picked out what I felt was important. By no means should you not look at the other stuff, but I wanted to hit on what I remember to be um, very high yield. Um, and this session is running long. So wanted to condense it down as much as I could. So primary care, um, <clears throat> this is common health problems. Secondary requires more specialized tertiary care. It's more complex, rare disorders. Um, in the United States, you can kind of enter at any level of this, but the preferred method is that you always go to primary because they can um, funnel you somewhere else if you need to be but we do have different medical structures, multidisciplinary groups. So these are integrated specialists. The big one is the Mayo Clinic. So you have pretty much, you know, anything you need there at the Mayo Clinic. So that's the big example there. Community health centers, which are, they emphasize preventative care, general health, um, it, um, HMOs, um, this, you choose a primary physician that's responsible for managing and coordinating all of your care, and then you have to get approval to go outside of them um, if you need something else. So first generation, um, the Kaiser Permanente, they like this example. So um, this is a consolidated model with salaried physicians. We'll go into that a little more later. Global budgets, we'll go into that a little more later. So this is just kind of an overview of that. You just need to understand what an HMO is. So um, then second generation is the group model, um, network model. So just understand kind of what an HMO is. And then IPAs, um, it's a loose connection of doctors and they receive a cavitation payment from the HMO and then pays the doctors um, either through capitation or fee for service. Um, so understand again, what an IPA is. PPO um, receives monthly premiums from subscribers and employers. So um, the patient will um, select a physician and hospital approved by the payer. An ACO, um, Affordable Care Act. Again, they love the Affordable Care Act on the exam. Um, so a big thing is they want to increase primary care, because the idea is if you increase primary care, you're increasing prevention, and so you're decreasing costs along the lines. COBRA, this is for people who have um, lost their jobs, so um, they have the right to continue coverage. So, you know, if you lose your job or if um, you are not age, uh, you don't qualify by age for like say Medicare, COBRA is your option until you can reach the age of 65 and get on Medicare. EMTALA, this prevents hospitals from dumping. If you've worked in the hospital, you hear them throw around that term all the time. It's like, no, you know, that's an EMTALA violation. So basically they, um, you can't dump patients or uninsured. Um, and then you, physicians or hospital systems have to have notice before you send them somebody. So you just can't dump patients everywhere. You have a responsibility to every patient that walks through your door. Reimbursing, um, again, this is pretty extensive. It's not as complicated. Um, it is going to be pretty straightforward, but you do need to know the difference between them. So fee-for-service is basically um, you're paying for what you get. So fee-for-service Sounds self-explanatory, I hope. 
but um, you're paying for either the visit or the procedure, nothing complicated there. Payment per episode or illness. So um, it's a single bundling. So instead of just, instead of fee for like an individual itemized service, this is per episode. So anything that is associated with this illness or this episode is in the same um, payment package. And so you go in for A, you're billed for A versus fee for service. As like you go in and you need A, B, C, D, you are billed line items A, B, C, D. That's the difference here. Um, they um, associate risk with these. So this refers to the hospital to lose money or earn less money. This so essentially this means that if you go in and your um, services for this episode exceed the average, then the hospital is losing money on you because you're only paying for the episode, you know, that one episode, that lump sum. Um, so, you know, either you have the, the value is more, because you needed more or the value was less. So the risk was on the hospital. Capitation, understand this definition. These are just monthly payments. It's a fixed sum of money. Um, and so that's what capitation is. And this is to um, control costs. So capitation versus fee for service. Remember fee for service is basically itemized whereas capitation is a fixed amount per patient monthly. Um, then two tiered incorporates referral services. So the health plan pays for referral services through a different payment stream. And then you have three tiered. Um, so PCPs receive capitation and you get a bonus if there is an end of year surplus in the pool um, for paying for referral services. So look for those keywords. Um, salary. I mean, we all know what salary means, but it's like per number of hours. So the staff model HMO, so know what this is associated with. That's a big thing. Just It's associated with HMOs. The term salary was on the HMO slides earlier. Um, so I would look here, just understand that um, if you're talking about HMO, their physicians are probably salaried. Now, that was doctor reimbursement. Now we're talking about hospital payments. So fee for procedure, um, itemized bill. Um, so this occur, accrues heavy administrative costs. So you go in, it's again, kind of like fee for service. So it's fee for, fee for procedure, um, but you do have this reasonable cost for this specific thing. Per diem, so daily cost per day. So you get the bundling. And so when you do have this bundling, remember that the risk is on the hospital because if you bundle all of this stuff, if in this bundle, somebody requires more intervention, then the hospital is losing money on that patient versus if a patient comes in and they bundle all of this stuff and they require less intervention, then they're making money. And so that's the risk here, but it's per day and it's lumped in together. Um, per episode of hospitalization. So this isn't per day, this is per episode. So it's all the service for one patient in an entire stay. So this is an increased risk because um, I know if the length of stay intensity of resources is very, very high that they lose money. So um, this is per day, this is per hospitalization. So put those side by side, understand the differences between the two. Like I said, they're not really gonna make this complicated. You really just need to understand the differences between them so that you can pick it out in a vignette. Um, the global budget, they love, love, love this one. Um, this is associated with staff model HMOs. Um, they'll say, they'll give a description of a hospital or a system. They're like, how is this hospital paid or how is this person paid or something like that? And that's where this comes into play. Um, okay, we're ending the end, guys. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I'm tired. Whew. Okay, screening and immunization. Screening is very, 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 very important. 
Um, so you're identifying a disease when it can be more easily treated because a lot of times when you find some of these cancers or diseases, they are to the point where um, either they cannot be treated or it's very difficult to treat. Um, you are classifying individuals on the likelihood of having the disease like Brady talked about, you know, you want to screen people for certain things like when you're screening for, I mean, you're not really screening for COVID, but um, you want to make sure that you can rule out those who don't have it. So examples of screening techniques, questionnaires, clinical exams, labs, um, prostate specific antigen is one of them. Um, genetic tests, PKU, that's a disease that they do. And then mammograms, um, this is an important point, detectable preclinical phase. This is the whole get it before it becomes a problem kind of thing or get it before we can't treat it anymore. So without screening, um, we aren't going to diagnose these until after the system, symptoms develop. And very commonly after the symptoms develop is when you start going downhill very quickly. So um, yeah, and also the disease is going to begin long before the symptoms even occur. And so you can get it by a screening test and hopefully you are in a more favorable period of the disease to intervene at that point. Characteristics, it's inexpensive, easy to administer, minimal cost, reliable and valid. You don't just screen for anything and everything. Um, so if the disease is serious, if the disease is not serious and there is no real reason to screen for it, um, but if it is serious and if catching it early in the disease process can greatly increase patient survival, then that is a really big item in the pro column for testing for the disease. Um, when treatment before the symptoms occur is more effective. So for example, if treatment at the beginning of the disease is not more effective than treatment at the end of the disease, then there's really no point in screening because no matter where you catch the disease, the outcome is going to be the same. And then when the prevalence of the disease is detectable is really high. So you want to be sure that, um, you know, this is a favorable if you get it in that window. And then, so by this group, your blood pressure screening to detect um, is ideal circumstance. Um, expected consequences, true positive. So this is what you want. You want a true positive result and, or a true negative. Um, so it's not always appropriate. We talked about this. So gallstones can be asymptomatic and don't require surgery. So you wouldn't screen for them, um, because they wouldn't really cause problems. And then it says, even when lung cancer is detected, earlier treatment does not seem to prolong survival. Again, that's the thing where um, treatment at any stage is not going to differ in the survival rate of the patient. Adverse effects, false positive. So you don't want to tell somebody who doesn't have cancer that they do have cancer because not only does that mess with you, you are going to spend a lot of money and time trying um, and unnecessary invasive tests and treatments that you don't need. And then false negatives, of course, you, then the disease goes untreated. Prerequisites, um, we kind of touched on these. It's an important, why do you screen? Um, you need to understand the history of the condition. You need to be able to recognize the stage of disease. There needs to be a treatment. So if you're screening for something, you're assuming that you can treat it. You know, if you diagnose something, okay, can you treat it? If you can't treat it, then why are you screening for it? Um, early treatment improves the prognosis. There needs to be a suitable screening test. And so if you don't have a good test, then there's no real reason to screen. Um, you need to have facilities for diagnosis and treatment. And so if, if you can't treat it, then um, why screen for it? Costs need to be balanced. Um, yeah, you can look at all of that. And then this is the um, task force that um, determines the goal, that they their recommendations are the gold standard. So, 
selected screening test. PKU is a big, big one because, you know, in infants that they're all screened for because PKU, if you treat it early, you can eliminate um, the effects of the disease. But if you don't, if you don't catch it, then the disease will um, affect that patient over time and it builds up and you get worse. So, this, so now talking about vaccinations, I really just put this on here for completeness sake, um, preventable diseases. So smallpox is the first one that was eradicated. Um, so this is just an example of all of diseases that are able to be treated, uh, prevented, not treated, prevented um, by vaccinations, antigen versus antibody, just, you know, we know what these mean. So going over it, substance when introduced causes a reaction, then antibody is the response to that reaction or to that antigen. Herd immunity, um, you will have a question or two on this. Basically, you just need to understand that this is the resistance of a group to a disease in a large population. And the idea is that if most of the pop population is immune to it, then the entire population is protected because the possibility of somebody who is infected coming into contact with somebody who is susceptible is very, very, very low. Um, and so you do not need 100% vaccination rates. Again, if enough people are um, immune, then the chances are you aren't going to have people infecting people. And then um, to, for this to work, the disease agent must be restricted to a single host. So you can't have multiple hosts or you increase the probability that you will um, transmit to a susceptible um, person. And then transmission has to be direct. Active versus passive, you do need to understand the difference between these two. Active is you actively make it. So this is your immune system. So you get an antigen, your immune system recognizes the antigen, and then you react to it. And then it's long lasting and you have immunologic memory because you're doing it yourself. Passive, it's passed on to you. So it's protection that is given to you. So it's temporary and it can wane over time. So for example, you have boosters to some of your vaccines. So examples, please know the examples, maternal antibodies. So even though the maternal antibodies are active, because this is the mother's immune system having made those antibodies against something, they are being passed to the um, child or embryo. So across the placenta or in breast milk, that is passed to another person, that the recipient of that is getting passive immunity. Um, immune globulin, so I am pretty, um, COVID, I'm pretty sure one of the treatments that they've been doing is, um, Serum globulin, I think. I don't know. Don't quote me on that. And the hyperamine globulin, antitoxins, antivenoms, all of that is immunity that is being passed to you. Efficacy versus effectiveness. Just because something is efficacious does not mean it is effective. Efficacious does, just means does it work? Effectiveness does it actually help people? You know, it can work, but is this really going to have an impact on people? That's the difference between the two. So understand that um, those two definitions. Immunologic memory, again, you've gone over this in immuno, um, exposure to antigen, you have B cells that are gonna circulate in blood and those B cells are the memory cells. And then if you get re-exposed, the B cells are like, oh, hey, I remember you. And then they go and they um, activate the immune system. Types of vaccines. Um, a lot of you guys have had a lot of questions on here. I did not put the vaccine schedule in this review really because it's not that high yield. If you do have a question on it, it's going to be maybe one question. And um, it's what they would do is they give you the age of the patient. They give you what they've had up to that point. And then it's like, what is your recommendation? So based on the age of the patient, you're like, okay, they need this, they need this, or you're good. You're up to date. Um, so these, but I didn't put that in there. You can look over it. It is, if you're, if you want to look some, look at something right before the exam, you can look at it, but I wouldn't spend a whole lot of time on that. Um, someone trying to say something. Okay. There are different types, live attenuated and activated subunit toxoid. 
live attenuated. Mm -hmm. This is a wild virus that has been weakened through um, some kind of process. This induces humoral and cell mediated, Im cell mediated immunity, requires fewer doses. The polio vaccine, um, look, it says inactivated polio you can be used for immunocompromised. So you're not using the live attenuated in an immunocompromised patient. So the live attenuated, you're getting longer lasting immunity than the inactivated vaccine, but um, you're not giving that to the immunocompromised patient because the live attenuated is a live only weekend agent. And so you're not going to give that to the immunocompromised patient. Okay. That is all I have for you. Five hours. Wow. Does anybody have? Nope. <laughs> He's like, <laughs> this this is close. I think this set the record. We we did another one that was like this. But I for, for you guys, you were losing. Did y'all tell that at the end of that I was like done mentally? Yeah. The good um, thing, though, like some of the stuff at the end is a little more straightforward. I mean, you have to go over it, you have to memorize it, but there's not a lot of brain power that goes into. Anyway, well, we didn't intend for it to be this long, but we, uh, you know, with me moving <laughs> and everything, we kind of had to do it as this. So hopefully for the final, we'll break it up for you guys so it won't be so daunting. Um, any questions, message us, no big deal. Good luck on your exam. I'm going to post this as soon as possible so people don't freak out. Are they looking for the video? It's going to be posted, people. I'm sitting here. Did you, did you post it already, Brady? I thought, I thought it oh. was already up. Yeah, no, but... <laughs> Thank, thank you, Keisha. I, I did. Thanks, Keisha. Always, always, always a plus. Uh, I have uh, a consolidated, uh, I condensed the notes. Um, I've added Lindsay stuff. So if you go to the file I posted, everything is there in order if you want it. And like I said, I'll post the recording uh, as soon as it's up. If y'all want to review anything, message us with any questions uh, about school, about life in general. If you have questions, ask me. If you need a shoulder to cry on, you're welcome to contact Lindsay. Love you guys. <laughs> End recording.